We also have Jerry Wetch in here from the from the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission here as well so to support the support our presentation. Um, I'm going. You know, this is my eighth month here. It's been a, quite a whirlwind. There's a lot, a lot going on. Um, the, my colleagues before me have set a very high bar for these budget presentations, so I don't want to get your hopes up too much. Here. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, so, get starting as we go forward. We're looking at a proposed budget of three million three hundred seventy-one thousand and seventy-nine dollars. Um, the big change going forward that we're proposing, Maria, the finance, uh, Amy, and I, uh, Melissa. Are proposing is con the consolidation of the budget. You know, the special revenue fund um, has not been uh, successful. It has not worked out as planned. But it, it, in addressing some of those structural deficiencies, you know, I think the first step here is recognizing that we do have a problem, and then um, to move forward, we're going to we're going to take the parks budget and the subsidy that you have been um, adding to the revenue fund to make it try to make it whole over the last few years. Um, everything's going to be in one fund now called the Parks and Recreation Fund, the Special Revenue Fund, basically no more. Um, this is just uh, basically a quick snapshot of the, <coughs> the breakdown of what will be in that um, consolidated budget. You have the Parks, administra Parks Administration, that's the superintendent's salary. Um, you have the Parks Division, those are the maintainers we currently have, Memorial Field, Memorial Pool, which have been in the general fund, um, our golf course. Simsbury Farms Complex administration, uh, the programming that's the rink in the pools and the supervisor that's there, special programs, that's our day camps, our, our year-round adult programs, um, specialty enrichment camps, sport camps, that kind of thing, trips. Um, and then the rec supervisor, uh, so it's tagged to those programs. And then you have the, <coughs> the, the what was before the 70-30 split um, with the salaries of the director and the administrative assistant, um, and then the utilities of the building. Of the main building at Sensory Farms. Tom, I'm just going to jump in if we could go back to that slide just for a moment. So, a concept we had with the consolidated departmental budget is you had to look in multiple places within our general fund, within the special revenue fund, and only really if you kind of knew where to search could you truly see what the actual cost, um, the costs associated and the revenues associated with the department were. And with the challenges that the Special Revenue Fund were having, we thought, again, you know, we need to really get a good handle on the departmental needs as a whole. Um, and then, again, a lot of folks I found in my first year here, um, because the Special Revenue Fund was called the Simsbury Farms Fund, people, oftentimes people, you know, have conversations where they thought it was just the golf course, or it was like the golf course and the pools, and we would have to try to explain to them, well, no, it's actually so much more than just the golf course and the pools. Um, so, again, sort of the, the re branding, the renaming of the fund, as well as having a truly consolidated departmental budget to help with some of those transparency issues was part of what um, drove our, our thought process here. So just to be clear, <clears throat> are we shutting down the special revenue fund mm -hmm. and creating a culture parks and, or, and adding it to the culture parks and rec line item in the budget? Or are we moving culture parks and rec out of the budget into our new revenue fund? It will be, right, so the general fund components would be in the special revenue fund, but the special revenue fund would show the department as an entire, like as an entire department. So you would see a general fund transfer coming in for the activities supported by the general fund. So we're making the special revenue fund bigger. Yes. And I hope you'll follow our thought process with that as we, as we I'm move just, through the I'm presentation. Just, it's, it's framing it because I'm looking at the intergovernmental transfers and... Yep. I got questions on whether that's enough or not given the shortfalls. Yeah, we're so, gonna definitely touch on that. Yeah, because yeah. again, are we and are we gonna end up being right back into the same problem where we have to do transfers or does it make more sense to shut down the revenue fund and put it all on the operating budget, which we've talked about in the past as well. Which would be You're here. Yeah. I mean that's another option. I like that. <laughs> the, one, the, one, the one thing with the, with Wait the other option. That's, a, that's another option. The one thing that <laughs> agreement. Hold on. <laughs> he agreed with me. <laughs> yeah, we should write that. What happens a lot? John. You want to take a poll? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not passing judgment one way or another. Right. No. It's, it's, just, it's, 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 it's a lot. There's gonna be a lot of conversation with this. The one. The one thing the recreation, the, the special revenue fund set up. The, the the nice thing about it is it does allow us the flexibility for program growth. And to react quicker to trends in, in, you know, additional rentals, additional programs, you know, we're not set to have guesstimating in January now for summer of 2020 how many kids we're going to put in day camp. You know, the trend next year could be for more. The school calendar could change. Different things like that. The recreation fund does allow us some flexibility with that if it if it's run successfully, where we don't have the, the deficiencies with staff salaries and, and utility costs in it that a lot of other towns don't. You know, 
are challenged with in their funds. But it does allow you to react quicker to trends and supplies and you know ordering more arts and crafts supplies or whatever it may be. Your rental skates, that kind of thing. How so? Because don't those expenditures still need to be approved? Yeah, but with a, if the revenue fund is, is working in a, in a positive fashion, you have that bank built up where we can kind of draw from that a little more. A little but quicker. this board so, still needs to approve those expenditures, as does the Board of Finance. Well, I guess. Yeah, I mean, maybe we're looking, I'm looking at it a different way. My, my, the way I worked in Granby and the way I, I, my experience here when the fund was working is we were encouraged to kind of keep adding and adding and adding because we could count that, you know, count that money as, you know, banked and expand or transfer from another part of the fund, I guess. Maybe that's the way we're looking at it. I don't disagree, but from a fiscal discipline standpoint, we've, we've got 350 years of history where these two boards approve all expenditures okay. in this community. And don't oh. all other departments have to act that way? Yeah. What's that? Every other department in town has to project how many kids are going to be in school, how many kids are going to be. Co correct. But what, what, you know, what makes your my, thing special? Yeah. My understanding <laughs> of, of if a special re a special revenue fund that maybe works in some other towns is it's kind of like the revolving checkbook type of thing where our, we're, we're on the, the, the year, the season, I'm going to say, we're on the... The count, we, we work the better calendar. on a calendar year, just like the golf course would work better on a calendar year. We're going to work on a fiscal year. Sometimes you can't predict some of those changes Schools accurately. or... No, I get it. You know. So. Let's let them do the presentation. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right, so we have the next is the budgeted the budgeted FTEs. The one the one note here, or two notes, I, I apologize. Uh, the parks, the nine the nine FTEs, two of those are coming from the Board of Ed that are supported by the Board of Ed account. Um, I think now we're, for transparency purposes, we're putting them in the, the parks budget and, the, and offsetting it with the revenue from, from that. And the golf course, uh, we have four full-time uh, personnel at the golf course. The, we have four six-month, eight-month part-time employees that basically average out to an additional two full-time. That's how we're counting the six there. And what we did not include in the budget FTE number for the purposes of the presentation is our seasonal staff. Um, so that would be things like our lifeguards, our summer camp um, staff. Um, we did not include those folks for uh, the budgeted FTEs. This is more of our regular staff who are sort of here on an annual ongoing basis. So where do they get picked up? Um, they would be showing up in uh, under the um, the programs. But so, for example, um, I'm sorry, the name isn't coming to me. I have to pull up my tab. Um, the seasonal. The seasonal. Yeah. yeah. The 46400 and the 46200. Thank you. So the part time line items. And then some show up in the in the memorial as well, memorial pool account. Because <clears throat> I'm thinking like so special programs seasonal. Mm -hmm. That's the right. date. That's your so date. we've got we've got full time, we've got overtime, and we've got seasonal. Seasonal, right? So okay. seasonal will be like that. That seasonal staff, right? And you'll see the same thing in the Sinsbury Farms complex account as well. Okay. I mean, uh, part timers. We have well over, I would say, a hundred part time or seasonal yeah. seasonals. So yeah. true part time yeah. or listed as part time, but if otherwise folks are listed the, as the, the only true part-time people we have are in the golf are those four people in the golf course and Everybody those are the seasonal okay. okay thank you <clears throat> so <clears throat> as you're probably well aware you've heard this many times that our parks parks and ma parks maintainers do a fantastic job out there um but they're taking care of 535 acres of parks 25 acres 2500 acres of open space including our trails our beautiful trail system here um, and then on top of that, add the 235-acre Sinsbury Farms complex, the pool, the rink, the, the, the beautiful landscaping up there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're providing, we're attempting to provide programs and services for all ages and abilities in town. So what we're planning to do in the next fiscal year is focus on getting the word out about what we do. I think, to some extent, the Recreation Department has become stagnant in that, in, the, in a lot of respects. We haven't. Um, really kind of push the envelope as far as getting the, the word about new programs or services that we may offer. So we're going to try to do more with social media, more with the um, taking advantage of some of the free advertising in town, um, such as, you know, uh, making appearances at, at town events, you know, pop-up tables at the li at library events like the Maker Fair. Um, I, see, I kind of taken advantage of uh, something Lisa has done. They, they've actually been coming out to our public skates a couple, few times this winter with a table and doing crafts and, you know, kudos to them for kind of Right. jumping on that bandwagon early um, but so we want to take advantage of those type of things uh, getting getting our message out about uh, some of the stories that we have behind our programs and our and our seasonal staffs to the local papers and news media and, and trying to really hit home what we're doing in the positive message we have for for the residents in town 
Um, so hopefully we'll be doing a better job with that over the next year. Obviously the, the, the big chunk of time will be spent on the Parks and Open Space Master Plan. And hopefully, as Maria said before, we're going to start work on that later this spring and, and look at a completion sometime you know, next, next winter and, and deliver that report to you and carry forward over the next 15 to 20 years with that. Um, we have <coughs> just put into practice our new uh, point of sale system at the golf course. Um, so with, our, with, this new, with this new system, um, excuse me one second, let me just show you there. With the new system, um, we'll be able to sell our season passes and, and register people for youth clinics um, through that online system as well. Um, we're going to see a savings on our credit card processing. We'll, we'll have better financial recording, and um, hopefully be able to uh, get get again get our message about promotions, um, uh, things happening at the golf course to our members better. It's a better manage, uh, member management system than what we were previously dealing with, um, and it's also a uh, streamlined customer service uh, from a customer service standpoint. We will now be able to do, if somebody buys their tea time online, um, they can go right to the starter's uh, desk and check in with, you know, we have an iPad there, they can check right in. They never have to step some foot in the pro shop. If they do go to the pro shop, um, we now have a streamlined system in there that our inventory and our greens fees and our driving range balls are all going through the same cash register rather than having to do two separate uh, systems. Um, and then, as you know, Maria has said many times so far, we're going to be doing finishing up this analysis on the re on these deficiencies in the revenue fund, what we can do to make it work, and uh, hopefully implement those strategies going forward. So, as we started to talk about before, um, you noted the number uh, that's going to be going into the from a general fund transfer in, in tran general tra general fund transfer into the special revenue fund. Um, those numbers don't, ma you're probably going to ask why those numbers don't match. Um, that is because of the two uh, Board of Ed um, paid for maintainers and the $100,000 subsidy that you, that's in the general fund right now going to the special revenue fund. Um, we are projecting a loss at this point for next year uh, in the overall fund as it is proposed. Um, the golf course is showing, you know, we are projecting a surplus in the golf course. I think it'll be hopefully be more than that. If we're, we're using an average, um, the three-year average to come up with the number, or revenue number that I had. Um, I think if we have a good year, a good weather year and with the favorable conditions out in the market, uh, in the local market, I think we should do, we should exceed that. Um, the special program side, uh, we still have some challenges there with uh, other competitors in the marketplace where we have a lot of staff, uh, you know, we're challenged with staff and benefits in that area that other other entities aren't, um, and utilities, um, and we're looking at an overall increase of 5.2 percent. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, can we go back to the top? Mm -hmm. Maybe Amy, help me out. We're budgeting for a loss. So if we're transferring 1.256320 in, why aren't we transferring another 79760 so we're budgeting for flat? You absolutely can. So the only thing that we did is we <coughs> had things on the status quo. So anything that was in the general fund that was transferred over, <coughs> sorry, I don't know why I'm losing my voice, anything that was transferred over to the special revenue fund, anything that the general fund would typically pay for, we just moved that over. So if we had not combined funds and you just had that in the general fund and kept your Simbury Funds farm the same way that it is now, your loss would be 79000 All right. And that compounds the 192000 negative fund balance. So the fund then ended up being short, 272 yeah. Correct. So right. then the Board of Finance still has to make that fund whole because we're technically not supposed to operate a special revenue fund in the deficit. Exactly. And this is definitely one of those items that we do have flagged as um, one of the policy conversations for this afternoon. And we've prepared an additional slide for you with some preliminary analysis around the community use expenditures that we believe that the program participants through their fees are actually paying for. And again, whether or not you all feel comfortable making a recommendation to the Board of Finance in terms of um, what, if any, increased general fund contribution you believe should be made to the fund. Um, so that's sort of a larger conversation we want to have as part of the policy conversation questions with you. I have lots of questions, but we'll keep going. So <coughs> highlights in the budget for this year. Um, we're hoping to, through CNR, address some uh, <coughs> issues with park maintenance, some park maintenance equipment and the ice, and the uh, start to get work on the ice rink uh, mechanicals. 
as addressed in the, um, the 2016 engineering study. Um, so we're hoping to get on top of that. The, um, proposed, the, the proposed budget that we have before you doesn't um, just addresses the current level of services. We're not adding anything at this point. Um, and, and recognizing the, the structural difficulties that we currently have. Um, and then we've done, a rec we've done the, um, as I think I was back d done for you in 2013, I did a survey of roughly 30, 30 communities who have a revenue fund, um, parks and recreation, well, some of them have, some of them don't have, um, in the greater Hartford area. And um, you know, you're know you gonna get those results back as we go through the analysis, but it does clearly show that, you know, we're roughly spending a million dollars on recreation where communities of, you know, similar communities are our comparable group far exceed us. Um, South Windsor, Glastonbury, you know, those kind of people, West Hartford. Um, so, as we, if you know, when you move all this together, we kind of start to come back together. When you bring the programs and the parks back together, we start to get a little closer to the, the average number. When we talk about CNR, a couple of years ago, we instituted a fee and we just reaffirmed it on the golf course side. They, yep. pay, they would pay for their own CNR as, or as a result of that. There are no golf CNR, uh, CNR other than the golf. It's included in there, but it, those should stay funded through the, that mechanical account. Clubhouse Cedar Siding Standing Jeep Fund. My my understanding is that the that the golf surcharge account pays for equipment, not for the you know not for building. Yeah, I mean that um, buildings, or building. It's for making small fixes. equipment purchases. Yeah, that's why I understand the way it was set up was for those smaller equipment purchases. Yeah, CNR. Not not you know, large capital improvements or right. And that's always been the debate is we, we always talk about the solvency of this fund, but even if we make it quote unquote solvent, the town is still picking up the capital side. So to say yes. we're only spending a million dollars on recreation isn't accurate because we're also making debt service payments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Jerry and I have debated that for years. Um, all right, but that, that leads to the whole conversation of do we keep this fund or not? Because again, the accounting is still complicated because mm -hmm. we're doing partial in the town partial in a revenue fund. Who's paying for CNR here? Who's paying for CNR there? So, all right, let's keep going. So, you know, you, you saw, you got the presentation a few months ago about the, the bike, um, bike pedestrian master plan and what the different levels of expectation. Tom Roy did a good job of explaining what, you know, what the, we need to decide what our expectation levels are going to be for certain trails. So that's what, you know, we're kind of trying to address not only the current needs, um, but the, kind of the future needs as well, level of expectations. There's a high level, most of you who have had children play on the fields here, you know, Simsbury is known for its quality playing fields, quality playing, quality parks. Our guys do a fantastic job of trying to keep keep up with that. It's become harder and harder um, over the years as new facilities have come online. Um, so our current staff staffing levels have made this difficult. We did put a service improvement request in for an additional maintainer. You've probably seen that before over the years. It, it's really becoming to a point where we, re we really need that as these additional trails come online. You have the one, the old bridge park coming online. Um, these things, are, it's not just a simple mow anymore. You know, it's more more detailed than that, and and uh, the expectation level is a little higher. So I think you're going to discuss that later on. Um, we are support, continuing to support the new Simsbury Celebrates Committee. Uh, that, that committee, that new volunteer committee, did a great job last year pulling the event together basically in July, uh, starting in July last year, and uh, with, with very little staff support. Um, I said we've, we're going to be hopefully implement, implementing the golf point of sale and the new one rate fee structure to our advantage this year, um, and we're going to be continuing to analyze or evaluate and utilize new methods for gaining visibility and marketing our programs and really getting our message out there. Sorry, Tom, I have one more. Back on, back on the yep. first one of park mains. <clears throat> so six, seven years ago, the Parks Commission set up a new fee structure with the soccer club and all that. So there's money that they paid in, and then we, in turn, cut the grass, lined the fields, all that. So where is that accounted for? Um, I, I mean, it's, 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 that's, that's, that's the field use account. It's not showing up in the main, it doesn't show up in this main budget. It's, it's, a, it's in the field use account within another special revenue Yeah, fund. special revenue fund. Um, we do utilize. That's paying for parks employees to line the field. It's not paying for park. We don't take any salary out of that. We're taking line, we're, you know, grass seed and, and uh, line paint out of that. But the time doesn't come out of that? No, no. That's just basically um, <coughs> materials. Seed, fertilizer, pesticides. So that's useful. So that's not going to We also paved a parking lot with it once, too. We might Yeah, we did. I voted against it because the sock, you know, because that's not what the fund was for, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, because one of the Curtis parking lots was paved out of that. So that's in a different revenue, revenue fund. 
Cool. <laughs> not your fault. Not your fault. I'm no. sorry. There's a lot of history on this. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me say, you're doing a great job. Thank you. None of this is directed at you. <laughs> I've been on every subcommittee. Doing the best for, we can. I've been on every subcommittee for this special revenue fund over the last eight years. <laughs> so you know, you know what's going on. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go. Right, yeah. I get it. Okay. Most of the mess. Most of the mess is probably my fault. So, so uh, okay. we can move. If no, uh, no, no questions on the operating budget at this point. All right. Moving on to the CNR projects that we're, that we're looking at. So the ice rink condenser, um, and we're going to show you a picture of it right after this slide. Imagine if, you know, those of you who have central air conditioning systems at home, it's that big thing that sits outside your house and um, basically, you know, brings the air exchange. What is it? The, uh, it brings the uh, vapors in and it cools it back to the liquid. Back to the cool yes. Yes. So the key thing here is if our, our condenser fails, we don't have an ice rink. And if it fails in mid-season, you know, we're pr pretty much... We're, we're, we're lost, you know, that's a pool. Yes. Yeah. So there was an engineering study done in 2000, it says right here, 2016. Um, it did recommend that this, this unit be replaced in the next five years or so. Um, later that fall, that, that unit did fail and required $17,000 worth of repairs, basically patch repairs on it. Um, it is it is operable right now, but again, if it fails, we're out. So in the next, so for this year, we were hoping to get the rink. Evaporator condenser done. Uh, then the following in the following years, uh, the control panels for those for that for that system, and as well as the the rink chiller. Um, that's a picture of the condenser. Um, again, we need to kind of keep this up. If it, if those systems fail, we don't have a rink. Um, Jeff, this wasn't part of the prior capital projects that we did up there. We only did the pool stuff. We didn't do anything downstairs. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because we talked about because we had to update the chlorination system or whatever for yep. the pool. Yeah, those were completely right. okay. redone. That's obviously yep. different. The warming hot was different. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So the you know, as you know, the rink is coming on uh, this actually this year is the twentieth season of the new of the covered rink. Uh, go ahead. Um, so the next <coughs> the next thing we're we were hoping to uh, take on this year is the rink ceiling um, and paint and repairs to the ceiling up there. Um, if those of you who've been up there, the, when it was you know brand new and beautiful, it was nice and white, everything looked great. Then the birds came in and started to tear things apart. The town went ahead and put the netting in there. Um, the netting kept you know most of the birds out, uh, most of the wildlife out. It didn't keep at all of them, but so they've done some damage to the insulation in the ceilings over the years. Uh, there's you know we now have stained uh, trusses, um, beans. We have rusted peeling paint. You know it's 20 years in an outdoor setting. Um, your next picture is going to show you a. Uh, this is the before picture. This is the after picture. Um, you can see down the spine, the center of the picture, down the spine of the rink where the insulation is torn out. Um, that's what those blotches are. And then on the, the, the trusses to the left and the right, it's peeling paint um, in this view. <clears throat> I, have a hand, I have some handout if you want to see additional pictures of other shots of the rink. I can show you the staining and more peeling afterward if you'd like. This, but, that, that would be different if it was an, an enclosed rink, right? Yeah, well, yeah, if you don't have as much, mil, you know, I would say mildew and exposure question. to the elements, that yeah. kind of thing. It's a leading yeah. question about but You wouldn't have the birds. It could have been done when this project was Right, correct. Yeah, you wouldn't have the bird, you know, birds now flying now around in there so either. It would have been to enclose it. Yeah. <laughs> so. not, not now, but then. That's more important now. Cool. Still a lot. So we estimate, yeah, again, we estimate that project to be about $50,000. Um, we had a quote last summer for that. Moving on to the Simsbury Farms pool fencing. Um, the pool was built in 1976. This is the original fencing in 19, from 1976. As you can see from the two shots here, um, well, we've had Kerma come out and we've had our health district repeatedly say every year we have to get the pool um, inspected before opening. And every year they've, they've given Orlando and our, our aquatic supervisor a very difficult time about relicensing the pool because of this, the security fencing we have here. You can see on the left, the gap. this is by the waiting pool, there's a significant gap between the fence and the concrete um, foundation there i mean you could potentially somebody could come under a, a small child could go under the, that fence it's also at the height where somebody could could climb over that fence um, and then with the incident we had in hartford last year that's something we want to be uh careful or you know be more cognizant of um, same thing with the picture on the right uh there's gaps in the fence and again the height of it is 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 worrisome now the fencing um it's starting to age it's bl it's blistering there's some there's worn bolts on it we noticed last year um our nuts that are could be hazardous so you know we're looking for something probably in the neighborhood of an eight foot fence um in this area to keep people out and keep people safe inside as well so 
we're hoping to maintain a 2004 pickup truck. Uh, it's got 100, 190,000 plus miles on it. This truck is rusting. I can I can tell you from firsthand experience looking at it, it, it is rusting. Um, they've squeezed every ounce of life out of this truck. Our guys do a great job. Our mechanics do a great job of, of keeping things going as long as they can, but it is time to replace this particular vehicle. Um, we are hoping to get a, a plow and then an additional sander. We have two dump trucks. We have a sander now, and as Maria, uh, Maria or Melissa mentioned earlier, we do the sanding and plowing at the, the housing authority properties, um, not to mention the park properties. We have one sander right now. If, one, if that one sander goes down, we can't, we can't officially take care of those uh, properties during the, during the winter storm. However, getting the second one is, Getting the second one would allow us to have that redundant unit and also allow us to kind of take care of things more efficiently than we are than we are now. Paddle tennis courts. Um, courts were last resurfaced over 10 years ago. It's a specialized surface on those courts. It does wear. It's a, it's a gritty surface. It does wear after time. It's supposed to be done every three to four years. We just recently had an inspection done about six six weeks ago, coincidentally. Um, and the you know the, the annual annual inspection they highlighted the need to get the surface done, um, some fence work, some net work. Um, the, the, obviously, if the surface is redone, it's repainted as well. Um, that twelve thousand dollars should take care of that and make the and it's a revenue. The, the paddle courts. It's important to note that those are a revenue stream for Simsbury Farms. It's it's important to take care of those revenue streams that we do have. Um, and then we're looking for additional playground, <coughs> some money for some playground improvements. Um, we're proposing that the, the pieces of equipment at Memorial Park be replaced. They are aged. Um, you can't really get parts for some of those pieces of equipment uh, and replace them with something that will be a little bit more useful and safer for our, for our younger residents up there. And then the one capital, uh, capital project for next year is the, is the Greenway. That We have fencing failing. Um, there is some paving that needs to be done, um, obviously, and then signage, pavement markings, that kind of thing. Um, that's stuff we're, we're going to be keeping up with every every year. It's not it's not, not going to go away. So, go ahead. That's 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 the last slide. Okay. Thank you. Questions? You, you two questions. The, uh, the Greenway improvement is that going to be more focused on one part of the Greenway and the other? I know it's the south side of town is in much worse shape. Yeah, I, th I think when from talking to Tom Roy in, in Orlando, I think that's where, that's where we recognize the. I mean, it's the oldest section of fence, right. fencing too. I believe we do have fencing failing in other places places as well. Um, but I think that's that's the, the area of concern that we're hoping to address first. And the second question. Um, um, could we, we fully recognize the increased burden that you have with managing open space. Um, and so the, so the roughly $401,000 increase in that um, expenditure this year, do you feel, Tom, that's getting you into the zone of what is appropriate? Um, the 401? Well, it's an increase of 401. Overall into the, to combine the fund? Right. So do you feel that you have, are we heading to a place with funding for open space maintenance that is in the ballpark of what you need, or we'd be getting closer with another maintainer okay. or two, <laughs> to be honest with you. So staffing is a critical part. Yes, of it that. is. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, and just and to that point, Chris, that's something. Um, that when we talk about service improvements later in the day, I will briefly mention um, that I think that the Open Space and Parks Master Plan is going to help frame that conversation a bit yep. for us. Um, we definitely are sensing um, that we do not have sufficient hands to maintain all of our open space and our parks adequately. Um, but what that number is, you know, is it one, two, three people? Again, I think that that study is going to really help help frame that conversation for us in some of our future years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but it's there's definitely a need for sure. Yep. Yeah, Chris. Um, golf course question, question. I always get these, right? So, um, and maybe I'm just struggling because it's like old math versus new math, which my kids practice now, and I still don't understand that. Um, but just for clarity purposes, so the total operating budget is 946 this year coming up, right? Is that sounds, right? Yeah, sounds about right. Mm -hmm. And then. Fees budgeted or revenue budgeted is so. Does the I mean you consider? I guess the restaurant rent, the restaurant wouldn't be there if the golf course wasn't there. So that's Correct. Right. So, yeah, so I would say that's safe to say. Align the restaurant with the golf course, yes. right? Yeah. For revenue, mm -hmm. and then you've got my eyes gotten worse just as this day's gone on. <laughs> uh, and then if the fees are eight ninety, and then the golf. What's the golf surcharge? I forget. You know it's that? now it's a dollar fifty and three dollars. A dollar fifty for nine, three for eighteen. Now you approve that back in December. Yeah, right. But that's the, that's just the. It, 
Well, I'm sorry, what? 42,000. Oh, the balance? Yeah. Is that what you're asking, oh, what the balance is? So, it's for the, so basically, that's 963, those three revenue sources, yep. right? So you're budgeting a, a asset that's going to be positive for the coming year, correct? Conserv yeah, so I, I think we were pretty conservative on those revenue numbers. Okay, but I just want to get that right. All right. I yep. just want to get that out there. Not for the yes. conservative on the golf course. Yeah. Numbers, yes. Service. I get that service. I get it. I get it. Okay. Thank you. It also doesn't include Tom's time and other administrative It's been, in there and under the farm's administrative costs, right? But I mean, let's look at the pure cost of how you're operating this. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And just one quick point on the um, the schedule. I, I really want to um, commend Amy for her work in preparing the schedule. I think that the schedule makes. Um, looking at year over year, and again, the departmental as a whole, just so much easier to comprehend and understand. And again, mm -hmm. helping us to also see the fact that we have been running out of deficit and looking at fund balance. Um, we didn't really have a schedule like this before, and I think that this just provides a really clear snapshot of what we're looking at, and just want to really commend her and Tom for their efforts in getting us to this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Right, it really is. Uh, one more small note. Um, I think the, the dog park had approached us. Is there? Uh, is, is that, that in here? That that that's under yeah. service improvements coming up that's shortly. Okay. Yeah, okay. coming up shortly. Yeah. yeah. So that's not in this budget yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. And then but I saw there was a there's a CNR item for next year, not this year potentially. Yes, we'll talk about. We can talk about that. Okay. Cool. Okay. Tom, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. We are going to switch gears a little bit and move into capital and CNR. And the first presentation we have Burke. <laughs> We're going to start with Board of Education Capital. So you've got our listing, and I've got uh, get the presentation for all of you. Um, so I'm Burke uh, LeClaire, business manager with Simsbury Public Schools, and so I just wanted to talk about uh, the Board of Education um, capital projects as a part of the overall town plan. And um, go to the next slide. So there are th uh, these are the three projects in the first year, the 1920 year, that follow uh, the order of your um, listing. They happen to also be in the inverse order of, of costs. Um, the first one, if you could, uh, first one is uh, relates to underground oil tank uh, replacements, and this is both for Terrafield School and Simsbury High School. Um, we have to uh, the tanks have reached the end of their 30-year uh, life and that um, need to be removed this fall. So the situation at uh, Terrafil is we have to replace the oil tank with a new oil tank because there is no natural gas option there. Uh, we've moved to natural gas with uh, most of our other buildings. Um, so that uh, estimate is now based on working with an engineering firm to, uh, to look at that current cost based on meeting uh, today's uh, regulations. It would still be an underground tank. At uh, Simsbury High School, where we have a dual fuel capability, we just would not replace the oil um, tank, and so it's really just to uh, uh, remove the tank there. But um, if you can picture when you go into the athletic department entrance, the gymnasium entrance, the tanks are actually under the sidewalk there, and um, the oil tanks, the oil uh, trucks uh, park there as they have filled, which is probably one of the reasons why the sidewalk is not in great shape. So that'll be uh, replaced in that. Uh, in that section as a part of this project. Will there be, will it just be replaced or will there be a new design where they don't need to go on the sidewalk? It, it would just be d done. It, it, okay. it will not be it. replaced. It'll it will just be <coughs> taken out. Yeah. I may you. have misspoken. I'm sorry if I did. And so we had looked previously, so natural gas and terrafil is a dead issue at this point? Um, it's just not currently I, an I option. I don't know if it ever would. Yeah, they want to. Okay. Yeah, does Terrafield not have, in general, have natural gas? The, whole, the village doesn't have it? Okay. Four years ago, TNG approached us to see whether or not the housing support a standing portion of the running natural gas pipeline from the nearest location, Bluefield, all the way into Terrafield. 
at the time, they just didn't seem to be any traction. Gotcha. And the two main buildings were the school and the, the firehouse, and that's why they were, it was viable on their side, but the timing and the capital request on our side just wasn't viable, right? Right, and, and, and the issue for um, the natural gas, they were interested in um, large individual users rather than focusing on residential homes. Right. Um, as somebody who doesn't work in the natural gas industry, I really thought getting all of the homes in Heights have far more usage than a few key buildings. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks, Berks. Sorry. So the next project uh, is really uh, a continuation of school security improvement funding um, that we were able to to uh, receive from from voters in the in the current year. So as of uh, July first, we focused on um, our our door our door locks, uh, fobs, interior locks, uh, security cameras, uh, and a lot of work has been done. Um, in in uh, since July 1st, so we're nearing the end of, of that first um, sum of money, which was 850,000. So this would be in uh, essentially a second phase, and we have obtained architectural drawings and cost estimates for uh, four of the schools that are um, listed here. Simsbury High School is the the, uh, the last one where we don't have the cost estimates, but essentially what we're trying to do is replicate what we did at. Um, both Henry James and Squadron Line when we redid the main uh, offices. So after hours when school is, is not open, you must enter through the main office and there's the ability to, to buzz people in, see what, you know, see what their, their uh, purpose is, and that gives us uh, a greater uh, degree of access control over those buildings. So that's really what the focus of this um, second phase is. And then lastly, we have the uh, since we're a high school partial roof um, <coughs> replacement project. So I've been with the district since 2008, but I um, always thought of the, you know, we had this new high school roof or this new high school project, mm -hmm. but, the, but the roof was not all replaced at that time. In fact, this is this 105,000 square feet um, was put on in, in um, 98. So it has reached its, its um, lifespan and the cost estimates that we, um, have, which were based on architectural um, support, shows that uh, we would need a $2.6 million uh, budget at $22 per, per square foot. We do have the ability to apply for school reimbursement funding. Um, at this point, based on what we're all reading in the um, governor's budget, I don't know how the schedule would, would be changed, um, but that is that is what the, the um, um, capital budget budget was uh, based on and um, in terms of the the full costs of course are what we budget for so that that is not um, impacted by uh, the potential of, of what may happen with the state grant process so it is a um, lengthy process assuming that there's no change um, and that we were we would not be eligible which I have not heard um, we would really not be able to carry out the work until the following summer because we've got to go through the grant process which has become um, which has been uh, modified since we did the Henry James grant. We were the, that was the last year, uh, last June 30th, under the, under the older uh, system. So now they have a new, uh, whole new process, and uh, we're trying to be educated about that. Any other questions on, on the roof that I could answer? All right. Those are our projects. Thanks, Bert. Thank you. Thanks, Bert. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'll turn it over to Maria, Melissa, and Amy to lead us through the next few yeah. sections. Yes. Now here come the more difficult conversations yeah. today. <laughs> okay. So wanted to provide a snapshot for you of our capital funds and our CNR funds. Um, talk a little bit about those funds more holistically. Um, we did ask each department to provide you with the projects um, for the upcoming uh, proposed uh, fiscal 1920 budget, both for the CNR fund and capital fund. Um, but again, wanted to first point out again uh, that the revenues for the capital fund 
now include all anticipated sources of revenue as well as all um, all projects regardless of the funding source under the new capital budgeting policy um, our capital um, items that are above two hundred and fifty thousand dollars are included in this particular fund um, Another piece that I do want to point out, you'll see that um, there is a general fund or cash contribution. Um, when we were helping the Board of Finance prepare in November um, for their prep meeting in advance of Tri-Board as well as Tri-Board, the budgeting assumption guidance we had been given by Board of Finance was to essentially keep our cash contribution um, for capital flat. So we did our best to work with that budgeting assumption within the context of the capital fund and the CNR fund. Um, and again, you'll see as we kind of move along later today um, why I think that's really important that, that we worked with that assumption and tried to use cash where possible. Move on to the next slide. And again, here are our high-level planned expenditures um, for the capital fund. Again, mostly it's the education projects that Burke just presented, um, followed by the additional projects you heard about in detail earlier today. So again, we kept our cash for capital um, contributions um, level funded. It's just distributed between the capital and the CNR fund, again, working with that $250,000 threshold for the capital fund, and then the projects below $250,000 reflected in the CNR fund. Um, one thing I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of, again, is that we did our best to work with the cash available. Um, if this capital uh, proposed capital budget were to move forward, it would be the second consecutive year in a row in which we haven't used bond funds for any of our town capital projects. Um, when you start looking later at some of the information we're going to be providing to you around debt service, um, I think that's really key. Um, that again, we are looking at our routine, our more baseline capital needs, trying to identify what those were, trying to find cash to pay for those, and trying to provide a little bit of debt service relief. So as we start to get in some of those out years, we start to take some pressure off of debt service. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Can we just go back one real quick? Oh, sure. Just to, so that everybody understands. Including me, so the 5.9 is not what we evaluate the 7% debt guidance against. So that's cash and the total bond issuance, tar and everything else. Yeah. It's not the previous debt service. Correct. And the new debt service. Right. right. So when we're looking at numbers later, yes. Don't remember the 5.9 necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's what we're potentially outlaying this year from a total expenditure standpoint. But that's not how the debt service works in the in the future. Thank you. Good point. Thanks. Sorry, and I always no, said that because okay. it took me Thank a minute you. to realize that, too. <coughs> and I think we covered this next point earlier pretty well. But again, that under the new capital budgeting policy, we did uh, have a few operating budget transfers for items that were capital in nature that were uh, previously included in our operating budget that we've either transferred out to the capital fund or to the CNR fund. Again, a high-level snapshot of the CNR fund. Um, again, you can see here the various sources of revenue, again, regardless of where they're coming from. So I think this is really good, uh, major progress in, in this budgeting process this year. Um, and if we move on to the next slide, you can see um, our CNR fund um, budgeted expenditures. Um, again, this includes the operating transfers as well as a cash transfer in um, and the 416,000 that sort of has been the five-year payback method, which we'll, we'll touch on momentarily. So um, the Board of Finance, when they were working on their capital budgeting and CNR policy, um, decided that they would like to continue to use the five-year payback method. So uh, this is a, at a fixed amount that's been about $416,250 um, in cash. Um, again, there's sort of this five-year payback method for these smaller capital purchases. Um, one of the things that Amy and I were concerned about is we were sort of using the phrase that we were carrying a lot of internal debt. But at the time, we didn't have a capital reserve account or a CNR reserve account. And so we were, again, concerned to be carrying this internal debt without a corresponding reserve to essentially not have that internal debt. Um, some good news, uh, we did a little bit of digging and we discovered um, an account that was established in the 1990s um, that was intended to be a CNR reserve account. Um, so we were able to, um, essentially what had happened is the assessor's revaluation funds at some point in time, we think it might have occurred around early 2000s, maybe mid-2000s, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to tell, um, got commingled with the CNR reserve. And that there was so much transition with time, um, sort of that original purpose of the CNR reserve fund had just gotten lost. Um, and then because the fund had a funky name, it was called assessor's fund. But it, it'll, 
we were like, well, $1.9 million, there's no way this can be just for revaluation. So with the help of um, some former board of finance chairs, some former finance directors, a chick going back uh, four, fi four former finance directors ago until we found one who knew what the purpose of that fund was. So with some digging and some research, um, the good news is, is we do have a CNR reserve um, that makes using that five-year payback method um, much, more, much more reasonable. So that was, that was some good news to report. Um, we, again, we talked about the cash for capital and the operating transfers. Um, and then a, a key piece down at the bottom of that slide uh, is we developed a six-year plan for the CNR fund. I do want to share that this is still very much, um, it's very much a work in progress. And we, um, up until this point, have never budgeted for our smaller capital needs on a six-year basis. We were only looking at our CNR needs in one-year snapshots. Um, I, I was concerned about that because capital is capital, regardless of the dollar value. And as we really tried to start digging in with some of our departments, you know, we had Public Works, for example, had sort of an informal internal process that they were using to project out needs. Um, but then I, again, I want to just reiterate and commend Tom and Orlando again. I mean, they put together a really good analysis of our smaller capital needs, and we didn't have that. Um, so as you start to see, and again, this is going to need need some tweaking in out years because again, this is still a work in progress, but you can see that we have an incredible amount of smaller dollar valued capital needs. A lot of these things are, are just critical parts of our systems, for, you know, rink mechanicals, um, play skates, um, just, you know, basic equipment that the police needs to replace, um, such as their vests on, a, on an ongoing basis. And again, previously, we weren't capturing this anywhere. So um, this was part of a, a new budgeting process. Um, again, we're trying to get a better sense of what those routine baseline needs are. Clearly, you'll see in some of the out years. Um, Maria, can I, mean, I just? Oh, I, sure. I know I'm stating the obvious, but I just really want to lock it in, in in my own mind. So the explicit direction from the Board of Finance is cash for capital remains level with last year. That was what our discussions were when we were providing them with the scenarios was that, um, at least for the budgeting assumption purposes at that time we were working with, was to keep cash for capital at the level that it was. Okay. Do they understand what the new debt service payment's going to be? We will be reviewing that with them. So, yeah, so the cash for capital conversation is separate from the debt service, so that may change once they hear the debt service number? That's possible. Mm -hmm. That is possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, with the six-year plan, I know that there are years, <coughs> based on our current methods of funding cash for capital, that our needs exceed revenues that are available. So again, unfortunately, some of these items will need to choose, things will need to get pushed out. But again, this was our first attempt at starting to memorialize a capital budgeting process for our smaller needs. Um, and that detail has been included um, in your budget document. I do also want to point out for you under tab 25, under the CNR fund, um, we had a really productive um, sort of capital uh, discussion <coughs> with Missy Dununo, the executive director at the PAC, and Bob Hensley. Uh, Tom and Orlando did um, assist her in preparing some of that, and we received um, from them, which is included in your binder, uh, what they believe are some of the capital needs at the facility, both small and large. Um, they, this was also new for them, and, and again, Missy did, I think, a really terrific and commendable job here. Um, so this is also still a bit of a work in progress. Um, for the upcoming year, they do have a, a small number of projects that they hope to fund um, through donations, um, but in some out years, they're still obtaining estimates for you know critical pieces of equipment to the facility. Um, some of the things like sound towers that were never um, never included, but are very <coughs> costly for them to rent, um, and things of that nature. So again, this is also still a work in progress, but I think it's a good initial step, um, and looking you know we're looking forward to continue to work on that. So just one thing on this slide before we move on, um, Sean had asked where the 533 for the CNR comes from, and um, right here this slide will show you. So that 416, 250 divided by the 5, you'll have your 83, 250 in the fiscal year 20 budget, yep. plus your 270 plus your 180 gets you to your 533. So we wanted to bring to your attention the capital and debt service model. I know on Monday evening we raised, um, 
some concerns and challenges we think that the current debt service model uh, may have. Uh, as you know, the debt service um, expenditure line item is the most significant budget driver for us this current, uh, or excuse me, upcoming fiscal year. It's a 22% increase. That's about $860,000. Um, and when we're looking at the model, um, that debt service number is going to, to continue to grow based on um, projects that were bonded for some, some time back. Um, Amy, do you want to talk a little bit about the model challenges? Sure. So um, right now we're bonding for a lot of our capital projects. And one of the issues with bonding is we're basically paying more for the project than what we would pay for if it was cash. So you have the cost of the project, you have your interest associated with your debt, you have your bonding fees, you have your bond council fees, and then you have your consultant fees, all on top of the project costs. Um, so basically, if we don't put more <coughs> cash aside to pay for our capital needs, eventually we'll have to exclusively rely on bonding or projects just aren't going to get done. Mm -hmm. And I have a really good example in the upcoming slides that'll show this. And then just one other thing that I want to point out on this slide is just the last line that it takes more time to pay off debt than to incur it. And I think you all know this from your personal lives. <laughs> um, but just keep that in mind as I go through my scenario. So then on the next page, I just wanted to point out that currently the way that we're bonding, we're bonding for cash flow as opposed to projects. So basically we're incurring debt as we need the cash as opposed to the project year. So when you have been reviewing your modeling um, with that famous chart over the years, you are seeing um, say fiscal year 20, this is going to be the bar. Um, that was projected based on projects, but that's not actually what's happening. So the years of impact that you were expecting are not the actual years of impact. So for example, um, fiscal year, we bond every other year. So fiscal year 17 was our last year of bonding. And then we're going to have to go out again in fiscal year 19. So the theory behind it is that in fiscal year 16, 17, all of those projects would be bonded in fiscal year 17. So what happened is we're bonding for cash flow as opposed to projects. So that's not what happened. So now in fiscal year 19, we're still bonding for fiscal year 17 projects. And since we're bonding for cash flow, not all of that is going to be bonded for. So this fiscal year 17 project is also going to be bonded for in fiscal year 21. So as you can see, it has an impact on out years that you weren't predicting based on your old model. And this makes tracking super hard. It's really hard. Like debt management is all about planning, all about planning. And in fiscal year 17, if we're approving a project, unless I have a crystal ball, I have no idea where that project is going to be in 18, 19, 20, or 21. It's so hard. Things happen with projects. They change. Um, they get done faster. They have delays, things of that nature. Super hard to plan for things like that. So I'm just going to take you through um, a scenario that I have. Oh, it's not as big as I like. Chris can't see that, so we gotta. Can you enlarge that? <laughs> I can't see it either. Well, it's hard it's hard even to see. <laughs> oh, I know, yeah. but then it's not gonna capture my. Never mind. All right. Well, I think that's as big as we're gonna get it. So, so it might be the very bottom right. You can do it one better. hundred percent. Very bottom. No, he's getting. She's getting. Right, he's getting it. bigger. Bigger. Yeah, bigger. More. Bigger. I, there you go. There you go. Hit it. Hit it. One more time. There we there, go. At the top. <laughs> if you. Are you going to mess it up so I can't get to it? And then save <laughs> full screen. No, you just slide <laughs> the tabs back and forth. Is that better? No. <laughs> All right, close enough. We'll work with this. So, this is our current six year capital plan. Everything that's highlighted in purple is what's proposed to be bonding. So, at the bottom of this page, you'll see that we have. Um, I came up with like proposed bonding scenarios. So basically what I did is I had a slight increase in our cash contribution to capital over the years. I took into account any grants we would get, any low SIP money, any town aid roads, sewer use, and whatever's left over that we didn't have cash for went into bonding. So we're going to use fiscal year 21 as our example because I don't want to um, do anything related to fiscal year 20 since that's a conversation for you all to have. But for this example, let's pretend that fiscal year 20, everything goes as planned, we're in a great financial position, and all of those projects are approved for bonding. So now when we get to fiscal year 21, 
and your impact, mind you, is fiscal year 22. So when you go, so when I refer back to this chart, just look at this fiscal year 22. So right now we have our debt target guidelines set at 6.7%. Now, as you can see, if we include our current capital projects, we are way above that 6.7%. So we either have, we have a couple options. We can move up that line, but then we're incurring more debt. And if we move it up year after year, that's more debt, that's less money for the general fund. And um, moving up that debt line every year will impact your bond rating, your bond rating will go down. The other option is not to do projects. Mm -hmm. So let's do that. We go back to the capital plan. Can we stop for a second, can we go back? Sure. <clears throat> so this, this, is, this is showing us the change in accounting for the capital projects from a cash flow basis to a project basis, right? It does after fiscal year 21 because is the, the green, whatever that shade is above the orange, below the pink, that that's going to be approved debt, but not issued debt. Right. So I'll go through it. I'll, I'm getting there. Hold on. I mean, I'm sorry, but it, that's, <laughs> that's why okay. this is so damn confusing because it's, we're switching from, we're switching from approved debt or we're switching from issued debt to approved and issued. Right. Right. All right. So hold on. Yeah. All right. So now we go back to the capital plan and let's just rate these projects in fiscal year 21. What absolutely has to get done and what can we forego? So let's pretend for a minute that we're definitely going to do the radio system. That's a public safety issue. I think you'd rather move the line than have any sort of public safety disaster. So let's just move out everything else. Tom, look at he's getting keep Settle down, Tom. <laughs> Calm down. Tom's breaking out the night. It's just an illustration. <laughs> <laughs> now I know why there's room right here. <laughs> We'll give you the ash borer. That's right. Get to keep that. So we moved out everything else, and now all we're bonding for so that we don't have any public safety issues is this 2.5. Well, as you can see in fiscal year 22, we're still not hitting that 6.7 line. Okay, so let's go back. Do some more work. It's and let's take out fiscal year 20. We're not doing anything in fiscal year 20. Everything Burke just said doesn't make any sense. We're not giving them a roof. <laughs> they don't deserve anything. Two guys that can't. Now Burke has hives. <laughs> Amy, you've made more enemies in five minutes. Than I know, right? Made in 30 yeah. years in elected Thanks office. for doing that. I know, right? <laughs> so fiscal year 22, we eliminated all of our fiscal year 20 capital. We, we eliminated most of our fiscal year 21 capital. And look, we're still above that line. So now, let's go back. <laughs> let's take out the public safety. Uh -oh. Let's go crazy, right? <laughs> so now, with the public safety, <laughs> yeah. we're we right at that line, on. right? Yeah. But this is where it gets good. Because we're not bonding based on projects, we're bonding based on cash flow. Mm -hmm. After the fiscal year 19 issuance, based on projects that have already been approved, not including Henry James, we still have six million outstanding that we need to come up with cash for because the projects are already ongoing. So now if I go to fiscal year 21 and I put in, see now you screwed up my slide. Okay, cool. six, one, two, three, one, two, three. I put in that six million because we can't not pay our bills. Those are approved projects Those by the voters that are already in right. flight. Our yeah. approved yeah. projects are already underway. Right. And look, we're way back up on that line again. So it's not realistic to say that we're just going to stay under that line. So now if we go back to the capital plan, all of those things that we eliminated in fiscal year 21, which is all of these projects, I can't get the total because she switched my screen, but all of these projects, what happens to these projects? Well, they get moved on to out years. Well, eventually these, these projects become emergencies. Eventually we have a public safety issue that becomes an emergency. Say we have a public safety emergency the same year that Burke needs his roof because kids can't go to school. Then what happens? Then of course we're gonna bond for those things because we don't have the cash for them. So then what happens is we take four million in this year instead of spreading out two million in this year and two million in this year. So I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't bond. Um, I'm just saying, and bonding has its purpose, it does. I'm just saying maybe there's like a better combination that we could come up with as we go down the line and think about our debt planning for the future. Okay, <laughs> 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 
<laughs> All right, so now that you've completely killed, so, uh, so, so Amy, so, everybody. So, so, I did it with enthusiasm. You're all are done now. <laughs> so your better plan is spending more out of reserves. Uh, what's the? So not necessarily. There are ways to build up your cash for your capital needs without going into reserves. Maria has um, implemented this or been part of this implementation implementation in Mansfield, and part of that is using grantless growth, which she can speak to way better than I can. So if you want to take that. Sure, sure. So um, about in 2007, um, we were in a pretty tough spot in Mansfield, and we uh, had taken over, uh, myself and, and the former manager for um, our predecessors, and because we lost Pequot Mohegan money, we lost our capital funding. So we were actually starting off with zero general fund cash for contribution, and we had to build that up over time. And really, you know, the way we could do it without um, negatively impacting our taxpayers and having substantial increases in the mill rate was just we were very disciplined about new growth. So this might be one potential option for us to consider as we know we have some really good new growth years coming up. And what we did very carefully with store center revenue and other forms of new growth is we were incredibly disciplined and, and we did very little for a long period of time in terms of service improvements. And we said, wow, we really need to focus on our, our infrastructure. We need to be able to pay for our infrastructure. Um, and we slowly used the new growth to really build up our cash for capital. Um, we also did that to build up our fund balance. That was another area that we were weak in. Um, and it was hard. It's hard because we know that there are service needs and enhancements and that it's wonderful to add to your infrastructure, new parks, new trails. Those are all fantastic things, but we didn't have sufficient funding to pay for what we already had in place. And so again, that might be one pot potential method for us to consider moving forward is again, making hard choices and being really disciplined about that new, uh, the revenue generated from new growth and some of those out years where we're going to see some new growth with the development and trying to apply that to some of these areas like cash for capital. So we again, can build it up <coughs> without really driving up the mill rate. But we have so Go ahead, Sean. But we have a, we have a, so that, that, that's certainly an awesome solution going forward, but we still have a $6 million problem today. We're going over the 7% number, whether we want to or not. Right. No matter what we do today. Yes. So we're already yeah. above that. You're already out of the guidelines that were set by the Board right. of Finance. That's the problem. So we're all sitting here and it doesn't matter who or how, but this is, this is where we're all sitting today. So we also need to talk about solutions for how to fix that. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's not going to be a quick fix. That's oh. going to take but years. I do. I just want to go back to the definition. I, and I totally agree with what you're saying. That to me is part of the solution is you're, you're taking out a reserve because reserve you is can. growth of grandless oh. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. plus um, the the um, f um, the uh, underestimating tax collection rate mm -hmm. minus expenditures. So um, so. It really comes back to it's. It, we would have to think very think very differently about reserves than we yes. tend to think about them today. Mm -hmm. But I totally get what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, and Sean, you're right. We're now going to have to deal with project decisions uh, that are going to be very yeah. significant. So, just, so, from a budgetary standpoint, we we have to budget 5.2 million for debt service because that's what we're going to have to pay in fiscal 20, right? No. Oh, whatever, it's, whatever it is, yeah. Uh, debt service, 5.2 million. Oh, I'm sorry, debt service. Is that what's in the operating budget? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah. And yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, so sorry. We, have, we have no choice. Yes. Unless we find money somewhere else to pay down that debt, mm -hmm. we have to budget five. We have to budget five, two. We then add 1.6 on capital. We're at the, that's six, eight. Right. And then next year, when we go out to issuance, so we, we have to. We're, we're swallowing a $1.2 million debt service increase no matter right. what we do today. And that 5.2 is versus the estimated 4.9 that's in the budget currently. Uh, four. We have debt service, the... the Show it the, four. Four, 4.9. Debt nine? service, 4.9 4. million. Increase of 859 million. I'm just pointing out, Sean, that... Where are you getting the 4.9 from, Chris? I from, from Marie's budget presentation last week. Oh, my book has got four million okay. on the page. All right. Well, we don't need to debate that. Okay. No, we're, we're agreeing, but, it's, yeah. but there's a gap that has to be well, it matters has to be dealt right. with, right? Uh, and to Sean's point of what anything. he was just saying is like now we're in a position where this is something that we have to do, as a, as opposed to a position where it's something that we want to do. So, so just to, to that point, and I, I'm not looking to, I'm just looking for perspective and relative to history. So, this can't be the first time or 
We, we must have been in similar situations in the past, no? Mm-hmm. Never? No. We the had... closest we ever got to, well, we were over 7% when we did the high school, but yeah. we stretched it out, over, there was like mm-hmm. a couple of years. And last year, we thought we were going to be over 7% by a nose for one and a half or two years based on the prior model. So, I mean, but everybody did that. That's why there was 15-year bonds. Right. We understood that. The problem is, is none of us understood that there was still 6 million sitting out there of approved unbonded, unbonded projects. projects. That's the new information. To my mm-hmm. knowledge, that's never happened before. So, you mean that we didn't, well, you're not saying that we didn't know those projects were out there? We did. Literally? We didn't literally, know, we didn't know they were un- unbonded, un- unbonded. And unaccounted for in the debt service line item. So, we assumed they were. So the approach to last year's budget would have been clearly would have been different. We wouldn't have approved Henry James. Yeah, Henry James. Well, is Henry James would have we would have put the, to the voters. Okay. Yeah. Because we would, unless we right. made a conscious decision to go up to eight and a half or eight and a quarter or whatever it's now. Right. But that would have been a very different debate than what we had because the models showed us that we were going to stay at roughly seven percent. Now that also it doesn't change the merits of the project. No, not at all. But but, but it does. The, the decision tree may be different. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The now, do, where does, um, or not, the conversations we've had about um, that we are not properly, we are not properly um, at the level, the prescribed level that you want, you think we have to be at, correct? Oh, for um, the routine capital needs? Yeah. Right. I do think that number is going to be much larger. Right now, um, I think we have about 1.7 for cash for capital. Um, I do think that number will be much more substantial once we complete, you know, the facilities analysis and mm-hmm. the parks and open space master plan. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have that firm number yet. So does that? But so, but does that then just make this conversation? Is, it, I just to, just, is that just that much more worse? And we're just scared to have it, and we yes. don't want to confront it, or we have, we're going to have to confront it. Right, right, right. So, right, because yeah. what will happen, as Amy pointed out, is that if we don't pay for those needs in cash, then we're just buying for more things. And so, again, I think it's where we can finding cash to pay for those smaller capital needs. And in part, I think that's from what we've been able to ascertain um, is that we were bonding for some pretty small dollar valued mm-hmm. things. And we need to sort of break ourselves of that habit to, to get out of the situation. That's kind of part of it too. It's not only, um, you know, being very careful about what we're bonding for, but it's, it's breaking that habit of bonding for very small projects um, to try to provide some relief in, in the out years, um, which is why, again, with this particular budget, I was really happy that we were able to, um, you know, find a way to use cash to pay for um, at least the town projects. Again, that's not going to necessarily help immediate term, but as we're thinking about this as a long-term problem, the less debt service we're going to have to have on out years, you know, the better we're, we're off we're going to be. Just one thing. Do you have a schedule of those small pro- those projects? Because you just said small. We've, I thought, had a history here for the last five, eight years of threshold cap of cash for those small projects. Yeah. Um, there's not, been a combination, but yeah, I have not recommended it. bonds for small projects. Right. No. Things were sort of getting lumped in together. I'm thinking a good, for example, um, we had uh, $100,000 for the Parks and Open Space Master Plan that was lumped in with the Betty Hudson um, property and that park improvement. They were lumped in as one larger project and then bonded for. But then does it really make sense to be bonding for the Parks and Open Space Master Plan? No, but that was how the projects were packaged and then paid mm. for. Mm. Um, so that's how they were approved. I don't believe they were. They, they were approved as that individual items. That doesn't sound right. That I mean, I don't right. remember that happening. They were approved with the as individual I items. I can put together a schedule for the next Yeah, I'm, and I'm not debating line. what you No, but, I know. But it's, I mean, because we, we would send, because I would fight with everybody under the sun, surprisingly, <laughs> on how we sent this stuff to the Board of Finance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then they would sit there and go, fine, well, we're going to fund this in current fiscal mm-hmm. year. Right. And then we're going to fund this in next fiscal year, and then we're going to bond this. And there was a combination of that. And that should that was explicit in the approvals. Mm-hmm. So, Amy, I assume you've presented this to the Board of Finance. Not yet. Oh. And oh because I, I would assume they're going to have, you know, the larger say in. They will, but how since this, this is your out. recommended budget to them, you guys have first crack at it as to what you prepare for them, and then we'll have the similar conversation with them as to you guys made your decisions because of, and then we'll share with them. Now, what this runs into is, you know, in terms of the cash for capital, is their, one of their critical conversations is do we move our reserves up to 15 to 17%? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, the sense I've gotten is they're, 
the, there seems to be a majority who are fairly resolute on that. Mm -hmm. um, Last year, at so least. there's yeah. it just there's mm -hmm. you know, all these you know you know, are just creating pressures, but it is. But yeah. I mean, they're going to have to read. Well, they don't yeah. have to do yeah. anything. But I would recommend them that they reopen that debate and instead of bonding the outstanding six million, do we? pay cash for it sure or do mm -hmm. we pay down henry james by six Absolutely. million or mm -hmm. some and lower our 15 year up i mean there's ways mm -hmm. to do this yeah. right, right. And, and it's not, not we're not in money. trouble we have yeah. we no, have right. the money to do this it's just yeah. how do we figure our way out of this yeah and we so. should also look i am making an assumption here but we don't have enough um current accounts where we're going to have significant surpluses for year end to use any of that cash right typically in the past we've had surpluses july 1 and use that to pay for some projects well we will i mean we're talking about i mean we had extra theoretically we had extra money coming in yeah but we also put a million into health insurance Which, reserves yeah that's right it, that so that's an automatic yeah. that's already yeah. been transferred yeah okay, okay. <clears throat> uh, i'm just well, checking that yep trying and to get just, that number Sean, just to go to piggyback what you're saying just for the clarity for the audience as well is that absence um there, there's a, there are there are ways to to put, put us back into a positive uh it's directionally a positive strategy i'll call it a strategy right that is um the decisions can be difficult mm -hmm. uh, but those are all absent a tax increase which is what everybody on this camera wants to understand right but again we need to be clear to the public that everything we're talking about paying for here are approved projects mm -hmm. by both right. this board the yep. board of They've finance be, they, you board of education and yep. the voters so the voters. we can point fingers and blame and everything else but we're all in this right. together we've got, know. we've got to figure this it's way. not like we can't we can't cancel the trip we're still going on the trip we are, we're already on we can't the get, get right. no the tickets but I, yeah, we're still going no so one area that i could use some guidance uh, obviously there are some key decisions that are going to be in the purview of the board of finance on this topic what is the policy conversation or decision um, that we could come to right now that would be appropriate and helpful to the Board of Finance in, in this process? And that's both for Maria and Amy and also for this group. I'll go first. <laughs> Sean? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the bedrock of our fiscal policy has been debt service of 7%. And we've essentially never violated that. Yeah. Whether I mean, we can reopen that debate, but we're reopening it under duress. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's not the time to reopen. Agreed. Um, so we need to have serious <coughs> conversations with the board of finance about: Are we going to have a hiatus from that? But then, how do we get back to it? That's right. Or are they going to hold it to us? Which means we go to zero from capital. And I'm not suggesting that's a good idea. Because eventually we have to pay for all this stuff and we've talked about this in the past but there's going to have to be some creative solutions here and it's there's going to have to be some combination of mill rate reserve and debt to get us out of this over a period of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the good news is we figured it out yes but what? we we could sit here and i mean honestly we could come up with 50 scenarios today and until the board of finance hears this and until they get a chance to react to it mm -hmm. like we are I would honestly recommend that we we honestly put this conversation off until they've had a chance to hear it and suggest a joint board meeting. To, to I have agree. It. Yeah, I think we have to have yeah. the board yeah. of finance. There's, because there's two. Th I, I see so two. I hear two things. When the point is, we're 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 at the point of the budget, right? And we're at the point of the year and at the budget. And I we can This is for my second year hearing this. But you know, this is it'll be. This is the first time I'm hearing this. This is the first time I'm hearing this. And how are they going to react to this? How are they going to, we, we constantly keep talking in that manner, which is nothing that, it's not a treadmill we want to be on at all. We're not proud of one. And so it's something clearly we need to be talking to them either more regularly or more collaboratively or more impassioned about wh where we've gotten ourselves and where we have to be because we can't be doing this at the, the ninth hour, the 11th hour. And if we do do something, we seem to have also a habit uh, many organizations have a habit of doing something that may not be ideal but it fixes the point in time and then two three four five years down the road we make a change you say oh you remember we did this back then to get this solved for and they are generally looked on as not favorably the inflection in the voice when you say it is because they were either questionable they were either questionable methodology 
or they weren't really well thought out. And I think, I, you know, we can't be keep continuing to have these kinds of, at least I'm observing that part of yeah. it. Yeah. Eric, I would agree with what John and Cheryl have said. I just, I just think there's too many permutations of approach, all of which are really the purview of the Board of Finance mm -hmm. for us to, I think our job is to flag it and then quickly get some feedback from them, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, we're about to have another discussion on the health insurance fund, right? Yes. So that's not gonna make them any happier, honestly, so this is a bigger conversation. Right, and, and again, you know, I, I do apologize. I, I, to have to bring you all, I, I'll characterize it as, you know, bad news. Um, you know, this was our, our first real crack at really digging in deep into the budget. Um, and, you know, we did find some areas of, of concern to us as we were working through budget development, and we did just want to do our best to bring these issues of concern to mm -hmm. your attention. Um, but again, I think that in terms of moving forward and working with the Board of Finance and, and also with some input from, from your board, I think we can tackle these problems. It's going to take time. It's going to take some long-term thinking. Um, but, but I do think we can tackle these issues um, and, and move forward in, in a good way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should have to. But I mean, yeah. In all seriousness, we've we've got to focus on the solution here because if if folks start going down, I'm not saying just anybody here or anywhere else start going down the, it doesn't matter whose fault it is. We've got to we got to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't. There's no blame here. Thank you for bringing it bringing it yeah. up. Mm -hmm. this is, yeah. Yeah. This is a, obviously a compli complicated web of information. And mm -hmm. when did we bond? Looking back at memos, we've had four finance directors in seven yeah. years. And, and again. Nobody's fault from the past, present, or future. We've just we got to figure this one out. In the last budget you presented to us, you had been an employee of the town for four weeks. So I don't <laughs> I mean for not digging as deep as you have this year. Um, so can we talk about the internal service fund? <laughs> yes. Okay. Just, we might as well Other just, slides, you know. <laughs> we, might as well just keep the, we might as well keep the hits rolling. Let's do keep it. The bad news going. There's some more. Um, so are we all set for the moment? Any more questions on capital or CNR? We can move on. Okay. I'm good. I don't okay. think we can. Um, so moving on, uh, so what are the policy discussions we wanted to flag for you all? Again, we're the outside agency um, funding requests. Um, this is the agenda of the topics that we do, uh, again, we wanted to flag for you this afternoon. So for the outside agency funding requests, um, we budget for um, social service related uh, outside agencies uh, in the social services budget. And then for other outside agencies, <laughs> primarily in the Board of Selectmen budget. And then under economic development, um, that is where uh, we show our contribution to the Main Street Partnership organization. Um, due to budgetary constraints, um, as well as I do believe that outside agencies are more of a, of a policy issue for you in terms of determining what an appropriate level of funding is, since they're not more internally focused, um, I, I did want to share with you that we did receive some requests for in increased contributions this year. Um, you can see we received a request to increase our contribution to Meals on Wheels. Um, we received a request from SCTV. Uh, from the Chamber of Commerce and Mainstream Partnership to increase um, their grants or their contributions, however you might like to characterize it. Um, also on this list uh, is the 350th Anniversary Committee. You'll recall they presented to you in January. Um, they're seeking some seed money um, to help get started, pay for deposits, um, and they were looking for a contribution of about 35000 there is one small increase I did include in the budget. Uh, it's $488 for the North Central EMS Council. That's um, a slightly different agency. It's, it's more akin almost uh, in the assessment we receive to um, our health district and that we're part of a, a regional, um, it's a regional service. It's based on a per capita basis. Because uh, our population did increase, there was a small increase to our per cap number, um, which was that $488. So that $488 for that reason, because of the per cap assessment was incorporated into the budget. Um, but wanted to flag this for you um, to see what, if any, recommended outside agency grant increases you might want to think about adding. You certainly don't have to make any decisions today. Um, and then I mentioned on Monday evening, we included um, the applications from the outside agencies for you under your Board of Selectmen tab um, in your budget book. We did change that process this year. Um, we did ask for some data and some additional information um, to back up their funding requests. Um, we did also ask for some other information, such as their annual financial audit to ensure that they were actually solvent, um, a list of their current board of directors, et cetera. We didn't provide that level of detail in your budget book, but that's also available um, should you desire to see any of that and would like to just um, kind of throw this out to the group again to see if you'd like to discuss any of these um, requests for increases. 
As we talk about this, I think that keeping the 350th a little bit separate, just because it's not something that, it's a one time, it's not something that we've funded yeah. before. Yeah. Um, whereas the other question is, so there's a handful of, of agencies that have asked for increases. Mm. Um, so I thought that would be a helpful place to begin to start starting with looking at where, where we've the, been historically. And is the chamber an increase or a return? I forget. Uh, an increase from it's five increase. to 10. Yeah. So um, just my initial uh, instinctive reaction, I mean, we're over the, um, the, the um, recommendation from the Board of Finance. We know we're gonna go through an exercise of trying to cut back towards it. And we know that these are gonna be the increases that we'll have to get down to. So I generally start this process not wanting to increase unless we absolutely have to. That's just my general principle, and, and it's not to diminish the value of any of them, and I'm totally open to increasing them, but I really kind of start with, um, it, they would have to be justified pretty strongly yeah, gonna, for me. After we just went, went through, we're going to get sawed in half by anybody. Who, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think uh, I, I would set the 350th committee right. aside, yeah. but everything else, I'm really concerned, aside from who's asking us for the money, increasing any increase based on the discussion we just had and we haven't even got to the insurance stuff so but we're gonna have to have a serious conversation whether we even have the cash for the 350 once we figure out yeah. what the solution is for the okay. debt the debt service problem i hear it and again I, I love it but sometimes you got to cut the birthday party well that would definitely be one that i would advocate yeah. for not we do, yeah. but, but again I, I i hear what you're saying you know, i mean, yeah. I mean we got to wait if, if we're talking about not doing cash for capital in a couple of weeks and everything else we need plows and sure. yeah more than we need a birthday party and I, I, yeah I mean, i'm always i'm, I'm all for I, I want the 350 i totally understand it but if if we're going to get down into the nickel and dimes the only reason why i'm saying put it to the side yeah. is because the other ones are sort of reoccurring yeah. it doesn't mean that it's any more important or less important than the other that's the only reason why i'm saying it put to the, mm -hmm. to the yeah. side got it got it flagged yeah Okay, so I have the 350th flagged. Is there anything else before we move on to the next policy discussion? No? So the next area I wanted to review with you um, are what I characterize as service improvement priorities. Um, again, this was a new process, and I want to thank the leadership team for that. Um, this is going back to my days as a budget analyst and really looking at service improvements and enhancements outside of sort of your baseline um, budgeting needs and having departments provide a good cost analysis and justification request associated with that. And we probably looked in total um, at about 30 or so um, service improvement requests um, across my departments. Um, you know, the ones that sort of rose to the top for me as the most immediate need um, are the ones that are listed. And again, they're not included in the budget because of, you know, what we were looking at for debt service increases and what we were looking at for health insurance increases. But I did just want to raise some awareness for you of, of some areas where I do think we have a need long term. Um, one is the accountant position um, that Amy spoke to earlier in the day. Um, if that were to be funded, um, that would it is intended to be a shared position with the Board of Education. Um, so um, that particular cost is inclusive of benefits and the 53 and some change uh, reflects half of that cost. Um, another position that was spoke uh, the chief spoke to earlier was the deputy chief possession. Um, that would be the position cost with benefits. Um, another one that uh, Lisa spoke to earlier within the context of the library budget is that her admin assistant position um, was cut many years ago. Um, in terms of um, scope, and volume of purchasing and payroll alone. It's a very large department. Um, there are a lot of administrative needs there. If you were to reinstate four hours back to the position, it does have a pretty minimal budgetary increase. 29 hours is sort of our magic number for certain benefits. Um, so we can potentially reinstate four hours a week at, at a fairly low cost. Uh, the next item on the chart is dog park maintenance and supplies. Um, this is something um, that came to my attention uh, within the last year. It's a wonderful facility that we have. It's currently located down at the larger PAC facility. Um, my understanding is that it was a volunteer initiative. It was largely, I think, funded um, by volunteers. And it's been maintained by volunteers um, with supplemental labor coming from our, our parks division. Um, mm -hmm. The volunteers over the years have been uh, trying to fundraise and sometimes using their own money to pay for um, various supplies down at the dog park. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, my thought here being is that that is a town asset, but we never uh, budgeted any maintenance costs for the town asset when we accepted the park as a town asset. So currently we actually have no funding in our park's budget to help maintain the dog park. Um, and it's actually a really small cost. Um, Orlando and Tom, again, were very helpful in this regard. And we took a look at some of the basic things that volunteers <coughs> are paying for right now, such as um, the, the, the bags, <laughs> I'll call them bags, um, and things of uh, things along those lines. It's it's only about two thousand um, dollars, and so that's just another service need I, I believe we have. Um, um, Ryan, can I ask you a question about the dog park? Yeah. Do we have any increased insurance costs because we have a dog park? You know, I cannot, we can ask Kerma about it. I think it would just sort of. Be I thought I just read something in the insurance that, uh, that dog, parks and splash, dog, park? they just, dog parks and splash pads were. Oh going to be an area of concern for municipalities yeah. with their insurance coverage. Yeah, we can we can ask about that. <laughs> Mm. Um, Think about that. Put a splash pad in the dog. Sorry, I'm just making. It. Hopefully exactly. they are. Hopefully they are no dog <laughs> splash pad. Like we are dog just, splash pad. Yeah, just specifically for the dogs only. Well, it's just when we talk about the cost of the dog park, I think there yeah. there may be something else involved there other than yeah, we can, we can poop bags. Check. <laughs> yeah, definitely double there. check. Um, the next bullet point, uh, and this is in relation to one of the goals and priorities you had set um, for the Economic Development Commission. So one of the potential items for them to work on um, was helping to develop, um, or I should really say redevelop, our branding and our marketing materials. Um, it's been some time since those were last done. They're somewhat dated now. Um, this would be design, printing costs, et cetera. Um, Sarah Nielsen was terrific. She obtained a quote for us um, to essentially do a printing similar in nature to the one that was done many years ago. Um, the estimate we receive for that is about $18,000. Um, the one item that's not on here that we did briefly touch on within the context of Tom's presentation um, are the parks maintainers. Um, again, since we don't really know what that sort of magic number is yet, we don't have the parks uh, master plan yet completed. I didn't feel comfortable saying, you know, we need one maintainer, two maintainer, three maintainers. We just don't yet have a firm number. We know there's a need, but we don't yet have that information available. Um, so again, these are, I think, the most important service improvement needs we do have. At this point, they're not included in the budget, um, but just wanted to see if you had any questions around them um, or wanted to flag any of these items. So I have a comment about two in particular. Um, the dog park one is one that I've, I've had a lot of sympathy for um, since I've gotten to understand how the dog park is run. It's, it, it is such a, a small amount of money that I'm... Um, I'm tentatively supportive of that, despite the previous conversation that we had. Um, w what I'm struggling with with the economic uh, development branding um, is that is one of four priorities that we've identified for the EDC. Um, so it, it, if we choose not to fund that, I think we would need to reevaluate, you know, what their, what one of at least one of their priorities is. Are we going to be at the point of? fully formed marketing and branding needs in this next year relative to the progress that the EDC has made though? Good question. So, I mean, I don't know. I really want to make that a priority. I have no idea if we need it. Yeah, it's you know. to be ready to be needed. Sure, that's a, that's a great point. So I love the, um, uh, Bob Crowther, the EDC chair, I think had a really um, neat concept he brought with him from his, his former career of these work stream teams. Um, so they've broken into smaller teams. They are working on these items. Um, there is a work stream team. Um, and what we did is since there's there are four staff members helping, we have a staff member assigned to each work stream team. Sarah Nielsen is assigned to this team. Um, she's been working with two members of the EDC and they have been making some good progress in it. So I do think it's, it's very possible that if the funding was in place for the upcoming fiscal year, I really think that they could very much use the funds and actually move forward with with getting to the point of printing materials absolutely um i'm getting hot <laughs> <laughs> so um the other one the other one is the, um on the chief and maybe thanks chief you can um i'm kind of confused on that because the presentation earlier which i'm like i'm, I'm with sean you know everything for me revolves around public safety that's first and foremost so um so we are currently sort of somewhat taking care of some of those responsibilities, transitions some of those responsibilities over to the lieutenants. And we're, we're incurring costs there because of overtime. So we're incurring costs in overtime, but you're also losing the full focus of what a lieutenant should be focusing on as well, I imagine. Yeah. Um, so 
but but what I wasn't clear on was, <clears throat> is that a, it's not it's not optimal, as I, I as I think I heard it's not an optimal position to be in is to be using those three positions or two uh, t three positions three positions now two lieutenants two, two lieutenants I thought you had added a, your promoted uh, so two two, two, two lieutenants it's not optimal to be using those two to do this but is this you know is it just can it be a bridge how long, how long can it be a bridge for and is that something we should be framing the discussion around just besides just putting it up there mm -hmm. you know that's part of the decision tree right is how long can those that be a, a bridge for us so it's been a bridge for a year yep. uh, we went through uh, an 18 month bridge 2010 through parts of 2011 or, or 12 um, and that's really kind of the only history we've had of using sort of as a bridge I think that we're in a uh, uh, in a probably a unique period now. We have the two lieutenants who are close to retirement eligibility, and we need to be able to you know, continue our, our professional development with them. So we could be in a really bad uh, sort of experience standpoint in one or two years, and if we're still bridging. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the ideal setup for the lieutenants is, for instance, the patrol commander. The oversight is the patrol division in communications. Since we've had a patrol commander uh, as a lieutenant since 2010, that position has never been able to come in to work, look to see what's happened over the last 24 hours, and see what's you know happening on patrol and happening in dispatch, because they have so many other administrative responsibilities, personnel issues, purchasing, all sorts of things. Um, that that core aspect of being a patrol commander, you, you can't do. The other lieutenant is doing the same thing, except on the administrative side. Can't really be involved in the um, support division, oversight of the detective division, training, community services, animal control, because again, the responsibilities are so uh, vast that they just, they, they can't do that. So that's, that's where we have some some hangups. So, so just the longer you bridge, say, the more liability. So two, and more chances. two years from now, if, if 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 public service is at least some of us primary concerns, the um, I don't want to speak for everyone. Pardon me, I, I think I, two years from now we could be in a public service situation where we're not delivering the level of public service that our citizens deserve and expect. Correct. Correct. If we continue we, to bridge. We could we could be that. All right, could be there at any point. Yeah, because things get pushed. By. Well, I just you know you make these are they're, they are priorities, but I you're you're far more uh, you're far more in tune in tune with why they are priorities than I am. So I need your assistance to say okay, it's a descending order. Are they ranked by priority? Right. Right, and so um, the accountant position for me would be um, just frankly my number one priority. I think when you saw just what happened with the debt service and capital conversation, um, and as we start to talk about the park and rec fund uh, deficit, when we start to talk about the health insurance fund, um, when Amy had listed out a number of those internal control issues, I think for us right now that is a weakness and that we just do not have enough hands on deck to properly monitor and manage all the components of, of our finances um, in a really thorough, thorough way. Um, but then we also have those internal controls um, issues. Um, but certainly, I really do think that the deputy chief position is also incredibly important um, for the department. Um, this would be adding essentially one additional position to the command structure. Um, so that would truly be an enhancement for us. Um, but again, I think as, as the chief's indicated, as our level of professionalism and standards and service expectations continue to increase, Increase, um, I do think that this is, you know, potentially an area of weakness for us, particularly in terms of redundancy and depth within the organization. Um, if we were to lose the chief to a medical leave for three months, um, you know, I, I would be very concerned. I'd be very concerned in terms of our ability to continue to perform at the same, you know, the same standard um, that we would expect. So just a question. How did we get a second? So because we had three approved staff before, from a from a management standpoint, the police commission promoted a, an individual to a lieutenant. Yes. So, on, from my standpoint, that's actually made the problem more challenging. Had that not happened, I would have rather converted the captain position to a deputy position. But because we've okay. so, so the, the, you know, what I mean, I it's. Think I, I think I can explain that. Um, I don't. I don't think it was a problem. I think actually. It was, 
it was better done by that at the time. Um, one of the points is to flatten the organization. Yeah. So, uh, very strange setup to have uh, you know, a handful of sergeants reporting to a lieutenant who then reports to the, the chief of police. Although the captain's position is higher, that captain was out of that out of that loop. Mm -hmm. So everything kind of went up to the top and kind of went up in a very strange manner. So adding a lieutenant sort of flattened things off, and then but we need to fill that fill that void. That 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 captain's position could have been very easily converted to deputy chief, but the best thing would be to then have a lieutenant as well. Yeah. So which so look, I guess <clears throat> which is more important, the two lieutenants or having a deputy chief? Um, it's, it's a little, and there's pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the challenge. I, I really wish yeah. we had all had this conversation before the decision was mm -hmm. made. Because, you know, I'm not second guessing it, but if we so, had three approved management positions, mm -hmm. that would have been the time to have the discussion of what we're doing from a conversion, whereas the police commission decided to make two lieutenants and we didn't get an opportunity to weigh in on whether it should have been a deputy chief. Is, is what I'm saying. Can I maybe jump in? Sure. So, again, um, you know, our chief is still relatively new. He's still in his first year. I'm in my first year. Um, you know, he and I had some lengthy discussions about not wanting to make any significant changes um, organizationally during, you know, that first year and sort of being methodical and conducting an analysis to see what our needs are. And, and I do just want to make sure that folks are, are clear that this is a, an additional position. So this would bring us to four as opposed to three. So we currently have three folks sort of in that upper level command structure with the chief, the two lieutenants. Over the years, it's been some combination of, let's say, a chief, a captain, a lieutenant, or two lieutenants and a chief. Two captains at one point. Two captains and a chief at one point. So there, for a long time, there have been three high, you know, high level, high rank, uh, excuse me, folks of high rank within the department. But that number's been three. So this mm -hmm. proposal would actually be to add a fourth person. No, I understand that. that. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I just I, want to make sure I, that I, 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 okay. Yeah. No, that's not what I'm debating. But what I'm debating is you don't get the fourth, you only get three is the structure you have now, what you really wanted long term. Because it's a chicken, it's a, are you forced, I'm not implying that you're forcing our hand to only do a deputy chief, but had we had this discussion four months ago, would we have ended up doing a deputy chief instead of a second lieutenant, is my point. Because we needed to decide. It's, it's a service improvement right now versus what was best for the department. And I'm not suggesting it wasn't the best for the department. But if we told you you're never going to get a fourth position four months ago, would you still have made a second lieutenant? Is, it, is, is the question right? And you don't have to answer it, but that's that's where we are today. I, I think, you I, I mean? yeah, I, I would say I would have to then reevaluate in some time. That, that's that's kind of my point, and I'm, I'm not I'm not second guessing your decision. You run the department. You you know what you're doing. Our town is safe. It's great, but you know if we put this off, you know as as the retirements happen, is that when we have this discussion? And then we reallocate because if, if we're not going to go to four, and maybe we will, but if we're not willing to go to four, then we need to talk about the management structure. So, so I, Chief, I mean, is, I'm sorry, but okay. is this going to help those problems downstream that you mentioned in your presentation? Yes. You know, more investigative time, you know, more of those sort of service things that you haven't been able to get to? Because would I would be concerned about just adding sort of management administrative without the downstream improvements that you have identified. Right. So using those, those those ratios or those standards of the 1.8, the 1.5 that I was using before, um, it will help in a sense there, uh, but just barely because that's one person. One person. Right. One, five, one out of five to seven. Right, to but 11. if those lieutenants could now do other right. things that were right. so more central. Really where the struggle is, is being able to manage all the things that we do. Mm -hmm. and manage those things um, above the level of sergeant. Being able to to manage the sergeants, manage the work that they that they supervise, um, it's, it's really that our our overall management of the department. That's yeah. that's where the need is. Will it help? It, it will help it as far as the trickling down. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will certainly help because right now we don't have a lieutenant set up that can spend significant time in oversight on the detectives for investigations or for control. It's not here. It's when, it's when they can get to it, or it's when a problem is brought to their attention. Mm -hmm. As opposed to already having those checks and balances. 
Well, and that is a safety issue. To, right. yeah. I, I'm, you know, my interpretation is these three staffing recommendations are staffing priorities that didn't make it into the budget Correct. just because of how tight it was. Yeah. You know, we can add them back in. I'm receptive to that, but then we're going to, it's going to represent a 1% increase of the budget. Okay. And then we're going to have to fight our way back by looking at other things. Other things. So, right. so I think, Maria, the question is, is would you prefer an exercise of putting those three in? And, I, and we can debate the other ones as well, but the staffing for me are the priorities. We, is your preference that we put them back in to the mix and then fight and then fight our way back to where we get to or is your preference to keep them out you know i think for now my recommendation would be that we hold off and we keep them out um, as we move on to um, the policy conversation around the structural deficit with the parks and recreation fund as well as some of the challenges we brought up on monday night as well as some new discoveries um, with the health insurance fund um, as much as i think these are so incredibly important um, we just may not be able to find the money to be able to do them this year would it be helpful as an exercise right now to sort of talk about directionally which of these we would prioritize or would we want to hold off on that conversation? My problem with doing that, I, my, my gut tells me I'd like to do it, but the problem is you end up looking at the dollars. So it becomes, let's just do the dog park because it's only two grand, but we really should be looking at this more holistically of what's going to be the biggest benefit to the town, not Dollar that's, that's my dilemma anyways yeah now there's one of these three that for me is a real shame and that is the you know saying no to the 5650 because being on the um, library board the impact on that um, for Lisa seems similar to you know the positive impact that the more expensive other two would have mm -hmm. and I'm just just highlighting that that you know you're passing up a big impact for can I speak what? to that ahead. for a yeah. As I spoke about in my presentation, I, because the administrative assistant position is at 25 hours, I actually regularly perform about, on average, five hours a week of administrative secretary tasks because they need to get done. So the cost for me to do that is about $13,500 as opposed to the admin secretary doing it for fifty six fifty. Absolutely, I agree. The, the challenge I have with it is we made several library position changes, changes in the last 18 right. months, and the salaries went up each time we made those changes. Redesignated. So in order of priority, if those were not the most important changes, then this should have been in there. I believe the salary, the salary only went up for one position for the um, moving up the borrowing, the head of borrowing and technical services. Okay. That was the only position. There was one up over the last two years. There's a couple of them. Um, I think so. Okay. I'm, my mistake. I'm wrong. That's okay. But as we, that's my point, is when we do this stuff ad hoc, and then we get mm -hmm. to the budget, and we've got to make sure that we're, we're, and I know you are, that we're looking at what's the biggest problem. <coughs> and to be, to be to, and also another point is that we've been trying to increase these hours incrementally, incrementally over the course of a number of years. So you've seen this, I believe, before. Yeah. So this is not the first time you're seeing these hours being bumped up. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so again, We'll sort of park service improvements for now, um, but if we want to loop back to them and start thinking about adding some back in, um, we do have um, uh, a worksheet that we can pull up at the end of the day today where we can start adding things in, taking you know things out. If you, if you if we get to a point of feeling like we want to just start seeing some additional scenarios, we do have a worksheet that we can you know pull up and, and work through today. Oh, should we, um, does anybody need a break? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just going to suggest okay. maybe five. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Let's um, come back at 10 after.
people started meeting without me, but I got Yes, thank you. Um, so this is something I know we've been having some conversation um, over the last few months is that we had been doing some analysis on the Parks and Recreation um, Fund or what folks often refer to as the Simsbury Farm Special Revenue Fund. Um, and six out of eight years, um, since the costs, excuse me, costs were shifted um, to the fund, um, we have finished in a deficit position. Um, we are currently projecting a deficit for the current fiscal year as well as next year um, without any changes either in general fund contribution or some staffing reductions, um, which would then make um, the fund finish out again eight out of 10 years in a deficit position. So we do have a, an issue here, a challenge, uh, where we do have a structural deficiency within the fund. Um, in large part, um, we have a number of expenditures, again, that I characterize as community use expenditures. So those are um, expenses associated sort of with the department as a whole and the general parks and, and, and rec department that are essentially being subsidized by our program users. So these are folks that are participating in camp or perhaps going to the ice rink during um, you know, public skate, that those program fees we're actually paying for a number of expenses that would typically be paid for um, by the general fund. Um, so we put together an analysis and identified a number of staff and administrative costs that are really supporting the department as a whole. Um, and we provided a high-level summary for just conversation purposes today. Um, that's about $263,000. Um, that is largely um, salary and benefits for our director of the entire department, as well as the admin assistant um, who serves the entire department, um, as well as other um, administrative costs that are, again, serving the department as a whole, not just programs. Um, another piece that we've identified that our program users are paying for are our building and facilities cost. So the cost of the building itself at the farms, whether it's cleaning supplies, whether it's um, you know toiletries for the restroom, um, whether it's fixing the elevator when it broke, that was something that actually happened this year, um, electricity at the building. Our program participants are actually paying for all of those costs at the building. Um, in comparison, you know, if you were to say come into town hall today, or if you were to go into the library, or you do you were to go to Eno, um, we're not asking people or program users to, to pay for cleaning supplies for the building or to pay for, again, toiletries for the restroom. But these are things that we're asking of people who are using our parks and recreation services. So looking at what those costs are, um, that's a little over $86,000. Can I ask a question and, on Sure. That? So I understand the, when you make the comparison to the library to, to parks and rec, but the difference is mm -hmm. if this was a private entity providing programs, maintenance costs, capital costs, insurance costs would all be loaded into the program fee. Sure. Right? So it's it's not exactly apples to apples. Cool. Right? Because you're the from a program standpoint, either you're doing it as out of the goodness of your community and you're having the taxpayers subsidize the facilities for someone else to come in and use it, or you're having the program folks pay some proportional, and I don't know what the right number is, mm -hmm. for the capital expenditures, and that this is the debate we've always had in the funds, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, well, if you went to the YMCA and took swimming lessons, you're going to pay for those swimming lessons, and part of that money is going to cover the overhead in right. the building. Right. The pool, the water, the, the cleaning. The, the, <laughs> right. And we're, right. we're accounting for that. I mean, right. We, it's the people who are up there playing t who don't take a tennis a tennis program, but they go to play tennis on their own. They go up there to walk their dog. They're coming in the building to use the bathroom. The, the tennis players are coming in to, to you know, use the, the bathroom or, or, you know, take a rest in the, in the, at the, in the lobby area there. It's a lot of that type of stuff. I mean, there's the mow, the mowing of the hills. I mean, who does, who does the mowing the, along the walking trail and the fitness trail, who does that? I mean, that's a community use that, um, I don't disagree with you. Yep. Yeah. 
Right. And, and what we also did... Sorry. And what we also did in our analysis here is we did still a portion. Um, there are certain things, to, to your point, Sean, around the pools, around the rink, that there's certain costs um, around those particular structures um, that we did still portion off to the program users. This is more sort of, again, that general sort of overhead of the department as a whole that we were able to, to pull out. So when you look at the staff and admin cost, that's the total staff and admin cost that the program fees are subsidizing? Correct, correct. So is there any, was there any cost left in for the fact that staff and admin are helping administer the programs? And again, that would be a philosophical- yeah, part of their job, right? Sure, sure. And that would be a philosophical conversation. Um, again, as a starting point, um, those were the two positions um, from our analysis that we were recommending um, as a possibility for, for the general fund to cover those two particular positions because they do support the department as a whole. But one could certainly argue, is that too much? Um, yeah. So I think, can we really back up for a second? And I, I'm interested to hear the rationale for why we don't get rid of the special revenue fund altogether. Sure. So it's really, it could, again, it's, it's yeah. comfort level. There's two different approaches. We, if folks are more comfortable, we could certainly move this into, um, move this into the general fund and then show uh, the program fees coming in as a revenue source um, versus keeping, you know, keeping this um, in a special revenue fund. Um, I mean, it, it, it can't function as an enterprise fund because they aren't going to be able to generate sufficient revenues to cover the capital Agreed. costs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, I think that's more of a, of a preference. Um, I don't know Just Tom, to be, if you want to add. Kind of, it's uh, my point earlier, we, we set this, the point in time, right, it made sense. We set this fund up to solve for something and now we are looking back at it and saying we may not this may not be the right model for something going forward but we can't kind of get ourselves but I, I, I've done it many times in my career I'm running a business whatever and I, and I find myself I find a solution and then somewhere down the road I can either correct it or reverse revert things as I've corrected things or I have a different philosophical reason of why it exists now mm -hmm. but to me it seems like we or I, I would like to go to the point, ultimately, I'm sorry, it's very infantile thinking, but you have something costs you something and you have to either raise money to cover it or charge appropriately for it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where we should kind of get back to with this. I agree. So to go, to go one step further, I, I would like to see uh, an exhibit at some point in the future where the operating budget shows the elimination of the revenue fund because, you know. Yeah, we can I've, do I've that. been here for eight years. I've been on four different subcommittees. I've had this debate every single budget year. You, you need uh, you need a master's in accounting to figure out half the stuff that goes on down here. And even then, we have philosophical debates about how much of Tom or Jerry's time is it. And, and, and that's never going to end as long as we have this fund. And we need to. We're going to move this community forward on recreation and stopping the the debate on who pays for what. I think the only way to do that is, is to finally eliminate this. I mean, eight out of 10 years or, or whatever, I mean, we're in a deficit position. This fund shouldn't exist. Yeah, I, even I, if, I, if we were sitting yeah. here today debating this, we would not be creating a special revenue fund if we knew that eight out of the next 10 years, this fund wasn't going to be solvent without a taxpayer contribution. So to me, let's put it all in the operating budget, transfer the 192 to close out the, close out the fund balance, and then we need to we need to true up the expenses. Um, well, no, we don't need to true up the expenses, but we need to understand that there's going to be a revenue. That there is a revenue shortfall of seventy nine, but it doesn't matter anymore because that's all part of the revenue calculation. Well, right? philosophically, we have to agree that you know as taxpayers, we are going to support recreational opportunities, and that's what this is. And I think the special revenue fund has always been this type of barrier. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of been an artificial barrier between, you know, what the taxpayers think they're paying for recreation and what's actually happening right. inside that fund. And I, I just don't think that's right. Mm -hmm. and, and to that point, we don't have a single other department in town that's supposed to be revenue neutral. We don't tell the senior center that you have to balance your books right. or the library or I'd be afraid to see how public works would do it. God, they put tolls up or something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or, or the police or anybody else. They get Gary out full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> we break even. Yeah. So I, I agree with the sentiment very strongly. So I guess the question I have, you know, Tom, Amy, 
Maria, do you see any reason not to do this? So for me, keeping it in the special revenue fund, it's just easy to track the individual programs that should be making money because there are programs that either should be making money or offsetting their costs, um, such as the day camps. Um, if you have it in the special revenue fund, you can easily track which one is making money, which one is not making money. If you put it all into the general fund, which is fine, it's your decision, um, that gets lost. And so then maybe we should be raising rates for daycare, but nobody cares because it's in the general fund, so we just raise the mill rate. So for me, Amy, so something I really liked was your, your balance sheet mm -hmm. because I would have, if, if I was around when there was discussion of setting this up, I would have said, the, what you just described is the essence of why that fund was created, yeah. right? I, I would have said, all you need is a good balance sheet. Yeah, so You've got a program, it has expenditures, it has revenues. Is it equal? Are we happy with that? Are we not happy with it? What creative changes do we want to make? Right. So I think I actually, or do we want to continue that fund. program? I mean, yeah. maybe you have to make a hard decision at some point that some programs we can't continue to do because they are not either, you know, we do do that now. Desirable yeah. enough yeah. for, right. for the yeah. public? That or wouldn't change. Yeah, we do that on an ongoing basis now. I mean, everything's evaluated whether it moves forward or it doesn't move forward. Right. But um, now, but that's done inside the special revenue fund, essentially, not within the context of the, the general revenue. That's, that's a great point, Which is Tom. great. You Before know, the it's... special revenue fund, that, w that quality of thinking was there. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, Chris, can't you, can't you, on Chris's thought, I mean, can't you just... It's not an amendment to the budget, but can you not just have a a a sub P and L that just that inside the budget that just shows those numbers that you want absolutely as, as you want when, to see them? When this group changes over the years, when does it not become important anymore? I agree with you, but my concern on a sustainability standpoint is if the fiscal officer in the future and this board and the other board stop paying attention, like happened in the past, we get into a deficit. And then we have to go transfer sizable amounts of money to fix it because nobody was watching. It's not you. It's not anybody here. But that's happened in the past as well. So when it's a, when it's in an operating budget, I mean, if somebody's not paying attention, the mill rate at, at least is accounting for it. There's there's still it's it's easier from an accounting standpoint. And that's true. But you know. You know. I think it's the obligation of whoever's sitting in my seat to make sure that you have the information that you need. Agreed. And there should have been reporting every single quarter on not only the general fund, every single special revenue fund, the health insurance fund, the pension funds. Like everybody should be seeing that. Mm -hmm. We do not disagree with you at all. <laughs> That's not, that is not it. I'll second that. <laughs> so yeah, I, mean, I, I, I guess I, I, and I'm reiterating, I've, I just have, have always believed I don't need to have a special fund. To be, to be get reporting that facilitates me being a good manager and being Make creative. Yeah. And, and again, I, I look at, I, I really believe your balance sheet created what, what the attempt to do with the special revenue fund was. I mean, it's broken down by skating, Simsbury Farm pools, concessions, court rental, Apple Barn, miscellaneous, mm -hmm. golf course. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think any, any board at any time being driven by you know the board of finance with a cap and a mill rate is going to be pushed into being being creative. So I don't think it gets lost in the process. Okay. I agree. You and, I, and I think this. I, I'm beating dead horse, but even just naming it. I mean, just name special. I mean, some special revenue fund to me sounds as if there's something wrong, mm -hmm. and there's something. It's like it's like it's like it's rating, it's, this is problem. like uh, you know <laughs> this, this is like. Um, a, a movie where the CIA has its special fund to the side and nobody knows what it is because it <laughs> solves for things that nobody wants to know about. This is kind of like what this is. So, I mean, we should... Until it runs out of money. And then have to... <laughs> but from a management standpoint, it also opens it up to unnecessary critique and unfair, unfair judgment. I mean, I know you were joking around before, but this, the centric firms can't just spend money however the hell they feel like it is. We're all subject to the same constraints and controls. And that that opinion does exist that the golf course can just do whatever they want. It's not true. You know, the golf course isn't out there blowing millions of dollars of taxpayer money. And I think, honestly, I think this would change the perception of it to what, what is actually true in that, no, Tom and you guys are all subject to the same controls that everyone else is. We, we don't have anybody going rogue spending money that's unbudgeted. And that's and more transparent. 
So, Maria. Sure. So we can definitely prepare an alternate um, to this, which would show it in the general fund. That would then show the special revenue monies coming into the general fund, essentially, as a revenue. So we're going to see some expenditure increases to the town budget, very similar to the Board of Ag Shared Services we talked about earlier today, but there would be some offsetting revenue. So we can certainly work on preparing um, on paper what that would look like for you. That would alter some of the overall budget numbers, um, but we could definitely prepare those scenarios. I, I do also just want to know, in addition to a possible increased general fund contribution, um, you know, Tom and I have had some very serious conversations. I mean, we do and it will come out in part of the report, but we do have some challenges in what I would characterize as our recreation programming area. Um, and depth, breadth is just maybe not at the levels that we would expect. We're trying to work on that, develop that. But we did um, develop uh, a possible reduction in, in staffing scenario in that area should it be needed. Um, again, we understand that the fund cannot operate in a deficit position. Um, it's never you know, a great thing when you're saying, I have to reduce services or I'm going to be restructuring. But we do understand that this is very serious. And um, you know, should you decide that you know, the general fund just can't afford, you know, coming up with the funds for the deficit and we need to implement some sort of, you know, services uh, reduction or staffing reduction, we do have a plan in place that we could bring to you if, if it does come to that. And I would like to see that given we I do have to go through an exercise mm -hmm. of getting down from floor one yeah. to two five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two, I'll flag that as an item. Yeah. So, yeah. Would that, is that in place of trying to improve the performance of those programs? I mean, no, I assume it, so. It's a bit of both. Um, you know, I actually had this happen at one point in my career previously um, where we had a Parks and Rec special revenue fund that was in trouble. <laughs> and uh, we had a couple of underperforming areas and we sort of took a pause on some of those underperforming areas. We reduced staffing uh, through reductions in staffing, um, ended up making some staffing changes. And then as we slowly were able to build back up capacity and build back up our revenues, we were able to then build back up the staffing. But it was sort of saying and recognizing, okay, you know, the fund is in a bit of a crisis. We don't have enough uh, revenues to cover expenditures. Let's make some of the staffing, you know, reductions where areas are, suff are suffering. Spend some time and energy focusing on them again, but build them back up. And as they build back up, the staffing got built back up to levels that it previously was at. So that is an approach that we've talked about that we could, you know, implement here if we need to. But it's, but it's also inclusive, inclusive of services reduction as well. Mm -hmm. Just not the the program reduction as well. It's just not cutting bodies, cutting heads and toes, I mean, you know, fingers and toes, you have to it also. Could be a bit of both. It's a yeah, I mean, honestly, it, with, with less staffing, there potentially could be um, less staffing. I think there, there could be a reduction in, in programs and services. However, I, I think, you know, as we continue to go through with more efficiencies in the recreation department, in the recreation department and structure of things, I, I think the public, may, you know, if, if, we're, if we have to go down that road, I don't think it'd be as noticeable on the outside of things. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Okay. Should we move on to the health insurance fund? Yes. Okay. Do you want to? <laughs> 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 Can we go back to this morning? It was so <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We had very tough policy discussions yeah. for this afternoon, but thank you for, you know, for bearing with us. We, we do appreciate your time and, and energy. I know this, these are not easy discussions. Um, so Monday evening, um, I did cover most of the items on the slide for you um, with our health insurance fund um, that we discovered, um, again, maybe I should take a step back, that I had some concerns um, after last budget season around things you know, related to budgeting premiums, um, our health insurance reserve, preparing for contract negotiations. So we decided to engage um, in an RFQ for employee benefits consulting services. Um, the Board of Ed did assist us in that process and we did make a change this fall and began working with a new firm around October. Um, we right out of the gate, you know, shared with the firm that, hey, we have some concerns about how we've been budgeting for our premiums. Um, we'd like to take a look at our, our stop loss. Um, we were seeing some pretty significant increases in stop loss that I was concerned about, despite us having very positive claims experience. Um, and also our reserve and really trying to get a better handle on all of that. So we implemented um, through, through our consultants, they are now doing a monthly claims analysis for us. Um, so we're able to monitor month over month, year over year, and, and project that against budget. So that's been incredibly helpful. Um, but then we've really been also trying to work and sort of dig through this issue of how we've been, again, setting the rates, um, which are too low. 
Um, and so uh, just also going back to um, the reserve, we also um, had shared with you on Monday evening that recommended levels are 12 to 24 weeks of expected claims. That's because we are self-insured. That would be the equivalent of being fully insured, insured in, uh, excuse me, essentially. Currently, we have a little over 2.1 or eight and a half weeks of expected claims and a target number approximately we would be looking for is about 3.6 million in the reserve. Do you mind going to the next slide? So, um, and this is since Monday night. Again, we, this is an evolving issue. We're still actively working on this issue with our employee benefits consultants. We decided to go back and try to look at some historical information to try to un better understand how did we get to where we are? How did we get to the reserve not being at a recommended level? How did we you know, get to premiums being too low? And we put together an analysis. We, again, we went back at this point to fiscal 13, 14. And what we discovered is that we also have essentially a structural deficit within this fund as well. So what we have is where the premiums we have been collecting have not been sufficient to cover the claims, the claims dollars going out. Um, and that we've had a series of transfers over the years from various funds that have helped to offset some of that, um, but that it's created a system, again, of, of premiums being too low. Um, and again, this is one of those, um, those items similar to the special revenue funds that we've been working on, um, that we have been working on building. Amy and I feel strongly that you all on Board of Finance should be seeing this on a quarterly basis. So this will be something um, that folks will be seeing on a quarterly basis moving forward. Would you mind pulling up the spreadsheet? So again, we were really focused on during budget development, again, trying to get a handle on current year projections and next year projections. But again, looking at that, we thought, well, we should really go back and try to, to get this historical perspective. And as we've been digging further, the structural deficiency within the fund was discovered. Um, and Amy, would you mind walking them through? Sure. So, so this is um, your health insurance fund since 2014, and it goes through an estimated 2020. So as you can see here, we have all of your revenues of your 4.8 million, and then we have all of your expenditures into the fund, and then there's a section for any transfers in. So in order for a fund to be solvent, you have to be able to put as much money into the fund as what is going out of the fund. Just like in your own personal lifestyle, you have a household, you need to make sure you're making enough money to take care of that household. It's the same thing here. So as you can see, um, throughout the years, there have been significant losses in this fund. Um, here we had a transfer in from another fund. Again, this helps our savings account, but it doesn't help the fund be solvent. So if I were to take out that one year, these transfers in over the years, you'll see what our true operating loss over the year is. And as you can see, we're at a loss of anywhere between about 100000 all the way up to a um, million dollars. Amy, the line that says premiums, is that what employees are paying along with the town contribution? It's public. Yes, okay. that's yeah. everything all inclusive. Everything. And those are set from the benefit consultant. I right? don't know in the past. Now, going forward, they are going to be. I'm not sure how they were set in the past. Yeah, my understanding is we always had to wait, and then the benefit consultant would come in and tell us what the premium number was going to be. That was at least my understanding. They would, they would, they would recommend premium rates, right. and the finance director and myself would be part of the, the right. final, the final process. Yeah, they, they, on the insurance, sitting in the insurance committee, they would come in and say, "This is what your, this is your losses, and this is what mm -hmm. the, this is what the carrier, in theory, the carrier wants to cover the average increases they believe are going to occur." And, and generally, we were always given information that we were more favorable or the increase was going to be lower than other folks were going to be paying. Right. Did you ever have a discussion about retroactively what actually happened? Oh, I was not an expert in health. I, I do say that. Well, <laughs> I'm not blaming you. So no. that's, that's not my recollection on that. Yeah. What's that? We, I mean, you and I were on there at the, roughly the same time. Yeah, I was on there a number of years before, yeah. Okay. So the, but, the, but the conversation generally was, well, what's the question? Prospective versus reflective. Yeah, no. Never came in and talked about what actually happened in the prior year? Mm. And we didn't ask you. <coughs> I, I don't think that's a, a fair characterization. We had, we had history. I think the problem is that it was not looking at the total fund 
was looking largely at the claims data yeah. and not all of the expenses. It was just yeah. looking at two. So it wasn't not looking at the whole picture. Yeah. Definitely looking at history of claims and and how the you know, and how the claims were, were paid. It was looking at two. Not numbers. looking at both the budget as well as the, the you know, just the claims. Experience. Yeah, it was looking at two ba very basic. What's it, what, are your, what are your claims? And what's the premium need to be? Respectively, to have a margin return from the carrier. That Again, I, I'm not looking to blame anybody, but okay, so going on that, if you look at premiums in 15 of 10, 061, and claims of 10, 4, that's a deficit. And there was a small positive in, in the next year, and then you look at 11, 2 versus claims of 12 million, taking out all the fees and everything else. And those are still, those are, they're both two or, two or three years upside down without, without the fees. Right, and this was exacerbated by because there's another chart which I know confuses people, but the the 4.5 million isn't the whole experience for 14. There was another fund at the time. There That's was correct. Two plans when we were moving. Well, right. Cutting down right. from two to one. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And That's we'll all remember that was the the time that the board of finance decided to move money out of the internal service fund slash this one into OPEB to shore up. Right. And what we were able to ascertain from doing this historical research um, is that when that transfer was made, if you're looking at the internal service fund in its entirety, the reserve was only left with about $900,000 after that transfer to OPEB occurred, right. which is not enough. Um, and the challenge that we have now with those funds being in the OPEB trust is because they're in trust, we can't um, take money back out unless it is to pay for retiree medical expenses. So essentially now that those funds are there, they're there. Um, but again, this, this helps us to, again, get a better handle historically in terms of how we got to where we got. Um, but again, as we were doing the historical research this week, we realized that the fund has had a problem for a period of time of, of technically not being solvent. Um, again, that was something that we felt that was important to bring to your attention that we made this discovery this week. Um, and again, so this is really going to, and we talked about this on Monday, you know, we, we did budget for about a nine and a half percent increase in premiums um, in our health insurance line item. That was the second largest um, cost driver. Uh, we will have more f a more firm um, picture of what those numbers should look like uh, this month. Our consultant continues to work on that. And that number may ultimately be larger. Um, depending on the size of the increase, it is something we just may need to phase in over a two to three year period uh, in combination of getting our premiums to where they need to be in addition to building back up reserve. In part, for building back up reserve, again, we could we could take a number of approaches. Um, in part, you do build part of that into the premiums, but we may just have too far to go in, in doing that. Um, so we may need to think about um, year-end savings this year, perhaps. You know, we take and make a transfer at year-end to help build back up this reserve, or perhaps um, next year, instead of maybe making such a large contribution to fund balance, again, this, these would all be policy decisions, um, you know, perhaps we take a portion of that and make that transfer into this fund. Um, but it's going to take a combination of both building up premiums as well as um, building up the reserve in this account. Isn't the board of ed part of this? Discussion? Internal service fund as well, correct. Right. So correct. Who dry, <laughs> tell me about our board's responsibility uh, in connection with board of finance and, and determining that policy decision. Sure. So, you know, I think um, this is one of those matters that ultimately I, I do think the Board of Finance in terms of um, sort of where that money comes from in terms of if we do use your end, um, you know, your end savings or sort of fund balance targets and maybe um, taking some of that and apportioning it here. Ultimately, I think that responsibility uh, does rest with them. But I think certainly if you all feel strongly or have an opinion and you'd like to, you know, provide advice or input on the how do we get there, um, I think that that would probably be helpful feedback for them to hear. Sean? Yeah, can you put back in the transfers? Just so yeah. Because to me, and obviously we need to work with the Board of Ed, we had asked Burke, came up with the idea, obviously, previously, and asked the Board of Finance to move that million in because the idea was to give us budgetary savings in the operating budget because that would theoretically lower our premiums mm -hmm. because we would have more reserves. Mm -hmm. So that's it's awesome that the million went in there. So that actually has helped mitigate the problem yeah. a little bit here. But unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to get the premium savings that we were hoping for in the operating budget. But to me, on both, and I'm not going to speak for the Board of Ed, but on the Board of Selectment side, we need to send an operating budget that covers our premiums. 
to the Board of Finance. I think that's our obligation, Eric, to, to your question. Yeah. How they how they solve the, the solvency issue of the fund, I think, is theirs. Mm -hmm. that's, I'm, I'm struggling with, much like the, much like I was on the Cincinnati Farms Fund, we, we can't, in my opinion, we shouldn't be sending a deficit mm -hmm. to, to the Board. The, the, uh, and I'm, maybe I'm completely misinterpreting this, but from my experience past, just as an, in the oversight committee, the, uh, and if you go back to, so it would sound like you said that at a very high level, simplistically, part of the reasons why we're in this position is we haven't been, we haven't received high enough, we haven't taken high enough premium increases mm -hmm. to fund this obligation. Mm -hmm. But I, I also want to say that, you know, f many times the conversation occurred around with the, in context of negotiations happening as well with town employees and unions and what would be what would be possible who would be receptive to what so there's a dynamic there that's to a certain extent uh i think uh, outside of the control of um what we have there's a level well, there is. authority but there but, is. but there's an understanding that we have a reality to face and it's not just we're doing we're not increasing premiums for the sake of increasing premiums we have to get to a we have to get to a sustainable number. But remember, the premium itself is not collectively bargained. The percentage allocation is. But there's, but I just want to say, there's dynamics. The conversations generally occur while we're, you know we're in the. Yeah. It all depends on what the board, is, what the 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 union is going to take for an increase potential. Well, from a from an allocation standpoint, they don't get to debate the debate overall. That. No, that's correct. That's right. correct. Whether it's a dollar or two dollars, yeah. that's not the issue. Yeah. Their percentage is already. And fixed. they can they can come back and argue with us that we're charging too much on the premium side and squirreling away too much money and over funding. Mm -hmm. But that, that argument not here. Not, not here at all. That ain't gonna fly. <laughs> but I mean, I think I think Marie and Amy and 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 most are being very sensitive to the fact that this isn't just a taxpayer problem. This is an employee okay, problem. That's correct. Yeah, that's because right. whatever <laughs> premium number we pick. Yeah. Our employees have to pay it. Yeah, that's correct. Right. That's correct. And just a couple of points I would like to make in terms of trying to find a path forward on, on some of these costs. You know, I, I do really want to work hard at trying to have some cost containment measures as well. Um, something we've been working on with our new employee benefits consultants is identifying potential plan design changes around prescription drugs. So specialty medications, um, it's kind of emerging and they're doing wonderful things for improving people's quality of life, but they're also incredibly expensive. And so our medical claims are actually not seeing large increases. It's the prescription claims. That is just a trend everywhere. Um, and we think that there are about potentially five to six um, plan design changes around prescription medications in terms of how they're issued, um, mandatory generics, things of that nature that could generate six figure plus savings to the plan. Um, so those are things, again, we have an opportunity this spring. I will have a very honest conversation with all of our groups about the trouble that the fund is in and what we all can do to help make that better. Um, we will be talking about potential plan design changes. Um, another piece that we've already discussed with our consultant um, and they're beginning and we should have the results in April um, is marketing our stop loss insurance. The market, my understanding, and I had done this fairly recently at my, my past community I worked for, um, it, it's a good market. Um, I, I fully expect that there could be some substantial um, stop loss premium savings for us if we do market that. Um, they will have the results of that for us by April. Right. Um, so again, we don't have those numbers now, but we are actively working on that to at least try and reduce that number as well. So um, I think it's going to take some, again, so, sort of like debt service and capital, it's going to take some work, but I think that there are some measures that we can also do to control some costs here. But to that end, if we exit the captive or whatever that we're in, aren't there exit costs? So potentially, but- um, Which I'm all for getting the hell out of that thing because I didn't want to be in it in the first place. But. Yeah, so we have, we're aware of two communities that have left uh, the CT Prime insurance pool, uh, say within the last one to two years. Uh, one community had favorable claims experience like us, and our understanding is that they were not assessed a fee on the way out. Um, that there is another community, unfortunately, that had very bad um, claims experience, and they have been assessed a very large fee to exit the pool. Um, so our hope, and this is something we would need to work through if we were to come up with a plan to exit, is to ensure um, that we weren't receiving some sort of exit fee. Um, I would at that point um, certainly involve Bob because again, we have paid in more in premiums than we've taken out in claims. So in terms of an exit fee, um, we've more than paid our share at this point. Um, and I think that's something that we would have to really aggressively fight if they were to try and, and levy some sort of exit fee on us. Okay. So for today, 
do you know the number, Amy, to from the town side, what the major medical line item needs to be? I do not, not until we have the right. All right. We will be getting those shortly. This is one of the challenges with our budget process starting so early um, that we just don't quite have that final number, but we will have that soon. Um, they're working on that for us, and we will have that soon. So let's pretend just for one minute that – can you go back up just so I can see the fiscal years, please? Mm -hmm. Go up. Estimated 20 is what we're debating, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So right now we think our premium let's, – let's say the 15-1 holds true. It actually needs to be 15-8. That's a piece between the Board of Ed, the town, the Board of Ed employees, and the town employees. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly $800,000, $700,000 needs to be shared amongst those four groups on an allocated basis. So. And, and I will also point out, um, one of the other um, items we've implemented since we've switched new consultants is now we have a quarterly internal team meeting um, that is shared with the Board of Education. So Burke is an active participant, and we do go over um, a whole host of employee benefits issues, including health insurance, plan design, how it relates to negotiations. I think we go over the claims analysis. It's been really helpful. Um, and I do know that the Board of Ed has also budgeted a pretty substantial increase as well for health insurance um, because, again, we just knew it was going to be a major cost driver before we found out about the historical historical problem that existed. So at minimum, it's the, two eight, the 219 that we have in our packet right now from an increased standpoint. Uh, in the aggregate, our health insurance impact, um, the town budget was about $330,000 for a health insurance increase that we factored into what was presented to you on Monday evening. Is that just the general fund? Oh, that was just the general fund, I believe. We can get you a total number. Yeah, we'll, we'll I, have, I have a worksheet on that. Thank you. Yeah, we'll get so that the, to you. So help me out because the major medical line item always says 218. Yes, um, because when we split out the parks and rec fund, uh -huh. we yeah. took the health insurance associated with those employees and put it into the parks and rec. No, that's oh, back. And, and the sewer use fund as well, too, because the yes, sewer use fund, fund also fund. pays right. for insurance. So it is in um, so a couple of back. places. Yeah. Okay. So I believe the total impact was at 330. Yeah, we'll, we'll get you the firm number, but I think it was around 333. The reason I bring that up is because that's almost 2%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're getting up there. <laughs> so that's, there's nothing we can do about that. So yeah. when we have our line line by line debate in a little bit, remember that we're essentially at 1918, whatever it is, from a Board of Selectmen budget increase. And the guy is 2.75. 2.75. So we got. We don't have a lot of room to work with. No. Okay. Should we um, move on to the pension and OPEP conversation? There's good news there. Right? So, um, <laughs> I wish there was some good news. Um, <laughs> Sorry, sorry. It's, no, it is very, very serious. Um, so for pension and OPEB, our interest rate assumptions, um, something that has been discussed uh, over the last year with the Retirement Plan Subcommittee are the interest rate assumptions that we've been using for our plans. Um, we have been using an interest rate assumption of 7% uh, in the analysis, and our actuaries um, have begun to recommend that we work that number down over time to about 6.5%, um, that they think that's a more realistic rate of return for our plans. Um, it is a recommendation. Again, this is a policy decision, how um, aggressively we work towards getting to the 6.5%. Um, policy decision, whether we tackle pension and then worry about OPEB or try to tackle them in concert. Um, these are all, again, policy conversations. The Board of Finance does plan to discuss this. Um, again, this was something we brought to their attention in the fall after the Retirement Plan Subcommittee had made some recommendations around that. And I think we did also briefly touch on this. No, I'm sorry, we did definitely briefly touch on this at Triboard as well. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we just wanted to raise your awareness around the issue, let you know that this is something that they're definitely going to be considering. <coughs> um, and we do just have a quick table to show you for some various assumption scenarios. So again, as we mentioned, our, our current interest rate assumptions for our pension plans are 7%. And this particular chart is showing you um, our town pension plans, not the Board of Ed pension plans, um, and what it could look like if we were to reduce our interest rate assumption to 6.875%, 6.75%, or ultimately getting down to 6.5%. Um, and you can see that, you know, 
we can make some small gradual changes in terms of fiscal 1920 budget increase um, to, to get there over time um, or versus if, you know, let's say the Board of Finance ultimately decides, no, we just want to try to get to six and a half all in one year. Um, it just, again, this table shows you what it would cost us to change that interest rate assumption. Um, and again, how aggressively we, we get there. It's, you know, it could be done over a period of years. So our budget book currently has the 7%. Yes, it currently has a 7%. Right. Now the Board of Finance did say they would hold us harmless with that, right? Correct. Uh, and I believe the Parks and Rec Fund issue as well. We spoke with them about that. They had said that they felt that the structural deficiency really was a separate issue that we would tackle outside of the 2.72% as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I guess my point of bringing it up is given the new information, I'm not sure there's any value debating it today. We need to see in the context of what they want to do with the health insurance trust, what do they want to do with the debt issues? Mm -hmm. And this probably ends up third on the list from a priority. Yeah. I would imagine if I was them, it's important, but it's we, not me. once yeah. we clean up the, the other two issues, they, they can deal with it. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, that's their purview. The interest right. assumption is their purview ultimately. Right. So, yeah. 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 And then similarly, we just put together this table for you on the OPEB fund. Um, if we were to bring down the interest rate assumption, um, this actually would not have a budgetary impact on us unless we were to fully um, bring down the interest rate assumption to 6.5% all in one year. Um, this fund is impacted differently in, in, a, in a positive way by making that change. It, it, so. Um, lastly, you know, again, just we briefly spoke about this. Um, and again, this is a policy conversation, um, particularly the Board of Finance. But again, if you all feel strongly in terms of recommendations, um, we have been uh, budgeting a tax collection rate of 98.5%. Um, our anticipated tax collection rate based on data we collect is uh, typically around 99.5%. Um, so as an organization um, or as a town, we have not been technically showing a contribution to fund balance, but based on the budget we presented and the anticipated tax collection rate versus the budgeted tax collection rate, um, we made an assumption that the fund balance contribution would then at that point be around $844,000. Um, Based on, again, current, uh, current year, uh, we believe that based on those assumptions, it would be about an $811,000 contribution to fund balance if no other transfers occur to other funds. Um, so based on that, our projections are showing um, at fiscal year 18, 19 year end, we would be at around a general fund balance of 14.65%, and at 19, 20 year end would be around 15%. Um, so again, that's just some analysis we did around fund balance because we know that's been a topic of conversation in the past in terms of what is the right number for fund balance, where do we want to be. Um, and again, we just wanted to share that information with you and whether or not you have strong thoughts or feelings or opinions on this that you would like us um, to convey to the Board of Finance, um, I'd be happy to do so for you. So I understand that there's um, considered a, a practice where it's ideal to be between 15 and 17 percent for AAA bond rating. Uh, where do we compare to most Connecticut towns being at in the 14% range? Is that better, same, worse? I'd say better. Um, it, I just went through a call with Moody's uh, October of 2000 and sorry, uh, 17, so fairly recently. And what they were saying is that um, interestingly enough, because of our reliance on the property tax in Connecticut, um, in New England in general, that they have not been holding New England communities to the same standard as their national standard. So that they would typically, on a national level, like to see communities have a fund balance of about 15 to 17%. But that, for New England, it's been much lower, and for Connecticut in particular, much lower. Um, but that with the state's fiscal crisis, that they've become more concerned about fund balance and that they would like to see, it was just verbal guidance they provided, but that they would like to see Connecticut municipalities also working to being closer to that 15 to 17 percent. Um, I would say based on what I've seen for other communities in Connecticut, um, I think a, you know, a fund balance in the 13 to 15 percent range is pretty, pretty healthy. I think and, and to be fair, we've rate. had a AAA bond rating for quite some time. That is correct. That is correct. Never, I don't think we've ever cracked the 15. Well, no, yeah, but, but, when we got the AAA bond rating, the expectation was, I think, 8 to 10 or yeah, 20. Yeah, you say it's <coughs> move, move, move the line. Move the line. Yeah. Yeah. The state's in such crappy order. Right. Keep so, on us. Yes. exactly. 
So but I, guess, I think for us, we have been in, you know, so-called compliance for, for what they require for AAA bond rating for a long time now. But it's also, I mean, it's not just that. It's also the fiscal discipline that we've had and we continue right. to have. It's also that we don't budget for things like fund balance transfers to pay for operating expenditures. It, we've managed our OPEP mm -hmm. con contributions when one one counts has done that. We manage our pension obligations. You know, we've been responsible with our interest rates. You know, Burke has done a phenomenal job on the school side managing expenses. So it's 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 more than just the it's more than just the fund balance. For, one, for, oh, go ahead, Eric, please. It's a little off the topic. Uh, for, for me, it's always, uh, um, I like having exhibits that's very explicit as to what the actual collection rate is versus the assumed. Mm -hmm. um, it's always really bothered me, quite honestly, that it's not transparent because, in essence, what it creates is, you know, a non-discussed $844,000 that the Board of Finance uses for its purpose. So I do like having a, an exhibit that points that out. I don't like going to the Board of Finance because, again, this is their purview, how they use that money. Mm -hmm. I don't like going to them and suggesting to them, you know, what the um, fund balance rate should be or, or any of that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of decisions they're going to have to make with that money. So I, I, I really like us to be more transparent about it, but I don't want to step into mm -hmm. the realm of telling the Board of Finance what to do with that money. Um, I don't think they would appreciate it also. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I get on the one hand the argument of transparency, and we've used that term about 2,000 times today. Um, but on the other hand, when you don't budget for it, nobody can spend it unless you have a meeting in public and talk about it. So it's not like the Board of Finance has a slush fund where they can just go out there and spend money or we can. It's a non-debated contribution to reserves. That makes for an easy, I always feel it makes for an easy, non-discussed um, contribution to reserve without having a serious discussion as to where, all they, where, where that money can best be spent overall. It's, so it's not an overt conversation about, about the best use of, of the money. It is, but it's also a policy decision in the fact that Nobody has to ha nobody has to swallow a tough number from a budgetary standpoint necessarily. When you when you force us to budget at ninety eight and a half, you're forcing a contribution to reserves that's not necessarily subject to political pressure or year over year decisions. It's the same argument I make for why we have a five year CNR. And I, Chris, I get it. It's not it, it, It's to me, it's well intentioned because it forces a contribution because of the level we have to budget at. And it doesn't leave it to, oh, well, we can just cut the reserve contribution back 500,000 this year to solve the problem, and then it never goes back up. I mean, well, I guess I, I trust elected officials dealing, you know, openly with real numbers to, you know, make appropriate decisions, Sean. I mean, I, that could be true for any anything that's discussed publicly. I, I just, I don't disagree, Chris, but yeah. you and I agree on the CNR fund that it holds us accountable, and it's it's forced fiscal discipline in the past. And right. the CNR funding is the same. To me, it's the same argument. I have absolutely no problem. Fiscal right. Discipline. Right. And we and we decide to have that discipline. I, I think we're basically yeah. agreeing. We are. Yeah. It's a short way. It's not I, make a rec I don't want to make a recommendation to change it. That's yeah. that's their job. And, and given everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank God we have almost 15% of there because we're going to need it to solve some of these problems. I don't want to, but I do, I actually do believe that in our budgeting process, this should be a more transparent number. What gets present, what, what's always presented, and I've actually asked that this be changed in the past, we always present exclusively a 98.5% collection rate when we know it's 995 And I simply believe that in the tri-board meeting and through the entire process, that should be, it should be a separate little box that's up there, you know, in our spreadsheet, you know, and, and recognize. So it ends up being a decision in terms of what we add to reserves at the very end of the budget process, that's all. So I, I agree with not telling the Board of Finance how to spend it, but I actually do believe a best practice financial policy is to be much more overt about it than we have been. So um, for wrap up today, um, wanted to see if you have any other items for discussion that you'd like to 
to um, to discuss before we before we adjourn. Um, flagged items, um, we've been taking notes, so we will definitely get working on those items, whether it's analysis, additional schedules, answering questions, we will put that together and get that back to you. Um, right now, um, you are tentatively scheduled to uh, make any changes to the budget and potentially adopt the budget on Monday, March 11th. That is a regular Board of Selectmen meeting. We are trying to keep that agenda very light um, to keep most of the conversation focused on budget. Um, if folks are feeling that that's too rushed, um, we did send out a poll. I know a lot of folks are traveling the next couple of weeks, so it may be tough to get together, um, but we could certainly always try and do an additional meeting next week um, or um, after um, the March 11th meeting. Um, this particular budget that you all, I'm sorry, the budget that you ultimately adopt um, will be presented to the Board of Finance March 19th um, so we would have time um, the week of March 11th after that meeting if we could find some night in time um, that worked for folks to sort of have a backup meeting if you felt like you needed a backup meeting I, I, I certainly don't want you to feel rushed and pressured that you have to make a lot of decisions in one night um, I would also probably though encourage that you know it's, it was a lot of information to digest today and to not make any you know certain you know certain decisions today do you have a do you have a list of recommended cuts to get us to the 567 increase? Because right now we're at 4.13, which is 300,000 above the Board of Finances. Oh. So one, I think one sheet, well, two sheets that will be helpful. We left one at your desk today. Oh, yeah. And we also had a scale down version under your, um, your supplemental tab. So that 4.1 is because we are showing a number of the services that we weren't showing the full cost of in the past and there are offsetting revenues for that um, so that's things like our shared services with the Board of Education it's our contribution to the DNA um, it's our dial a ride grant so the actual um, increase is 3.4 percent and the difference was Amy would you want to go back to no he's actually referring to the 4.1 which includes the contingency oh the contingency yeah, yeah. Um, and would you go back to the slide that had the number that we would need to reduce to get to the Board of Finance guidance? Thanks. So to get to the 2.72% expenditure guidance, um, we would have to do about a $140,000 decrease to town government. Well, Maria, that's if, you, that's if you go on the assumption it's a 2.72% increase without the contingency. If you add the contingency to 4.13, we would have to cut 851,000. Okay. That was my question at the break. I thought in the past we've always presented our budget, including the contingency. Maybe, I, and I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But that was that was. So how in the past have we presented the contingency? It was included. Okay. Okay. And that I will definitely take you know credit for if that's how it's been done in the past. Um, I apologize if we no, can No, it's okay. It's, no, yeah. it, no, you don't need to apologize. Yeah. We just have I mean, your recommendation is your recommendation. Yeah. I'm just saying it creates a, to, you know, a larger it gap. creates a bigger yeah. gap. Yeah. And it probably would make sense for us to provide some direction in terms of, you know, are we going to be okay with that? Are we not going to be okay with that? Or? I mean, in the past, I mean, seven out of seven years, when we've gone in with a higher number, they've sent us back with a, what are you going to cut? And then we come back and have another meeting. Right. And we get to it, so we don't have to do it tonight or today. But I mean, to me, we got to shave two hundred eighty-four thousand four hundred and thirty-eight dollars off of the eight fifty-one four seventy-two increase, right? Knowing that could go up as well, based on the healthcare premium we get. Yeah, we always have looked at a list, right? I think that's, yeah. and I view that as a best practice. Yeah, we've always had a list. You know, without saying that we have to come in at the cap or or not but as a best practice and in, in terms of um fulfilling the requests working in good faith with the board of finance i always feel that's the best practice yeah, sure and one of the major again expenditure changes um when we were doing our initial initial estimates based on um, the premiums that had been set. Um, we were looking at average increases of around 6%. So when we provided those numbers to them in November, it was still very, very early in the process and had used the 6% assumption rate for health insurance. But you know, as you know, that number in the budget is actually around 9.5%, and it was a much, much more significant budget driver than we had anticipated. They generally don't care. That's the problem. Yeah. We've gone in and made that argument on pension. We've gone in and made that argument on health, and they don't care. They want us at the guidance. I mean, we can, yeah. we can certainly mention it, and, but they usually do look for the list. Mm -hmm. 
So I care because it matters because it's reality. But unfortunately, as, especially as we saw last year, they love the guidance number. I guess I, one thing we could talk about is would it make sense to have a meeting before the 11th, not to make any decisions because there's not going to be six of us there, but to talk directionally about what we would look to cut prior to the 11th? Well, maybe. When, did, when is the Board of Finance next getting together to learn what we've learned today? Um, March, so March 19th. Well, there's no point in us meeting unless we're going to talk about the cuts. We can't finalize the budget until we find out what they want us to do or if there are any impacts to our budget as a result of it or the capital side of it, right? Because we can spend all the time we want. If they don't find out until the 19th, then they need us to they want to change the guidance they need to use, whatever they need to do. We need to bother recommend the capital. You know, do we do our prioritization exercise? We need to have a discussion with them for that to happen. They need to hear what we heard today sooner than the 19th. They so they can then give us feedback so we can try to figure out what to come back with them. They need to have a special meeting. Yeah. But we can't tell them to do that. Can you can ask them to there. watch the tape. Yeah, but they, they need to have a meeting. It needs no, to be a call. Yeah, yeah. you know, well, and Amy needs to talk to them and do the same thing she yeah. just did. Yes. Yeah. So. And that's but not, I think not I mean, to your point. It's all coming out today. If we don't do that, it's gonna, we can't adopt our budget until we're supposed to be doing the budget presentation on the 19th. Great, because we can adopt our budget all we want. They're potentially sure. going to send us back and go have to adopt a different one. Sure. Yeah. So generally, we get we go to them, we talk, we figure out what we think the right numbers are. We, we push where we, we want to push, and then we adopt a budget that makes sense. Because once we send it up, it becomes subject to line item authority, and we no longer have a say on what's in or out. So I always, err, I always want to err on the side of, we are as sure as we can be that this is going to be the adopted operating budget because, in my opinion, it's our decision to best prioritize the town's needs with obviously you leading the charge and you telling us, you know, what we can't get through. If we if we send up if we send it up and dig our heels in or things change, they can cut things that they shouldn't cut or change it based on priority, and then it's it's mm -hmm. very challenging for us to fix that. You know, if they decide that they want to cut library, I'm not, I'm not suggesting this is it, but if they cut library hours or they cut police officers or plow drivers or being in those are the decisions. But if that's what it comes to, we need to have the discussion with the department heads, with the experts, and make a tough, thoughtful decision versus, uh, you know, a, a 40,000 foot line item because it just looks easy. Yeah. So I, I want us to retain that power. Well, and if, so, we're, if we were to push back at all, having gone through that exercise just adds credibility great. and uh, enables us to articulate the justification more. So. so I think we still have the meeting on the 11th, and I, I would ask that, Maria, that you leave the charge, and we can certainly supplement it with how we cut in the 285. You know, what, what's the list? What's the repercussions? Okay. You know, so similar to the analysis we put together last year for you. I think yeah. so. Yep. And I also think I would love, and again, we can do it too, but uh, a prioritization of capital. That's right. Um, and CNR. Just, mm -hmm. and again, because we can sit up here and, and have the discussion, but if you could, again, you guys in the department heads know best of what do we have to really, and I'm not, let's try to get it all if it makes sense, but, you know, if things start getting cut, we can do so in an informed way, thoughtful yeah. manner. <laughs> and I think. Again, our history has shown us that when we go through this exercise, <coughs> generally the Board of Finance is receptive to that. Do you need any more prioritization from us in order to do that? I don't want to give you a task that's yeah, no, I don't not think. possible without our input. So right, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I think what will be helpful is we'll update the um, the analysis we put together last year that showed. Um, all the service improvements that have been done, say, over the last five years will include also the most recent one we did, because um, sometimes that's an easy or place to look are things that were done more recently. Um, we'll update the, those cost estimates so we can get a good handle on that. Um, I do have a few, again, 
none of them are ideal, but I do have a few other places um, that, again, if we had to start cutting services and reducing staff, where I would recommend that we cut first. One of them we were open about and talked about today, you know, for example, um, to close the deficit in the Parks and Rec Fund would be to take a look at the, the, the recreation area in particular. So um, we could certainly work on, on that analysis and bring that back to you. I also think it's important because there are, there are a couple places, for example, in the, uh, the IT budget with uh, the Board of Education. I know it was offset by revenue, right. but the fact of the matter, they, we look at expenditures different from revenue, that, that 113000 is is a significant um, increase. So I think it would be really good to categorize you know, where we've made changes that mm -hmm. really are neutral from a mill rate mm -hmm. point of view, yes. right. um, but are driving our because we want to ask for forgiveness there, similar to we know we'll get forgiveness in a couple of other areas, you know, such as OPEB and the pension and stuff. So let them know it's not as right. right. Is that included in the Board of Education budget? Part? Those shared. Uh, it always is. So you've yes. already counted. Just check them. Yeah. yeah. So. But we need to be clear because again, without the full context, it looks like a massive increase. Right. It's not a, not right. accurate. So yeah. That's, a, that's where we open ourselves up to, to cuts that don't make sense. Yeah. Right. So yeah. they've already gone ahead with. It's 55 basis points, so it's a good, yeah, it's yeah. a good chunk of it. Yeah. We have a number of places where we have that, so. Okay. Is there anything else before we adjourn? Is there anything else that either of you need? <laughs> so, so just, just to make sure I'm clear, we're staying on the schedule yeah. we have currently, yeah. currently published. So. so you're going to give us a scenario without the special revenue fund? Right, so we'll show, we'll run it to look like what it would look like to put it all back into the general fund. Which right. We'll change sort of the totals, and but we'll, we'll put something together to show you what that would look like. Okay. okay. Thank you. It, this is obviously a lot of work. Appreciate everybody yeah, being here is. all day for us. This is, and, and again, I, I think everybody does a great job. I know there's some challenges here, but nobody's fault. We just got to figure it out together. But this is... This is awesome analysis, and I'll say it one more time: extremely transparent, so that we can we can really. That's two hundred and one now. <laughs> Sorry, two hundred and one. Again, I've I've been I, I I joke around, but you know, seven years ago, my job felt like finding all the tricks and nonsense that was moved around in the budget, and that wasted time, and it was a mess. Now we're really into what can, how do we provide the taxpayers with the right service and do the right things, and I really appreciate. It. How this is coming together. So thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks. Yeah. Well said, John. Staff's done a great job. Good. Oh, thank you so much. Again, I really appreciate your time and energy today. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Move. <laughs> Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye